Hello. This video is composed of every single part of the extremely long and confusing Pixar multiverse theory I have been creating over the past three years. This compilation video organizes them, puts them all in the correct order, and makes it easier to watch. Enjoy. Pixar tends to make their movies with four demographics in mind. Kids who will enjoy the movie for what it is, adults who will approve of the underlying message, critics who will critique the flawless animation and technical aspects, and finally, a demographic most filmmakers don't go for, the observant people who notice the secrets of the little universe they've created. I mean, just look at John Negroni and his Pixar theory. It's pretty great, and it shows that, well, Pixar has these people in mind. Luckily, I'm one of the people who strives to unbury the lore, and so, after scanning the movie inside out very carefully, I found secrets that line up with things that so many other other people have been saying, and I think I'm close to finally piecing together some of the biggest Pixar mysteries. Hello, I'm The Theorizer, and I hope you like my new intro. I never got a chance to talk about it in my last video, but I've stalled for long enough on this theory. Let's just get into it. While scanning through Inside Out for clues and hints, I came across something that, to my knowledge, nobody has noticed yet. Ellie from Up is framed in Riley's childhood house, and to be more precise, the exact same picture that Carl and Ellie had in their house. At this point in time, we know that Pixar is far from doing anything randomly, so we have to take a moment to consider what this actually means. When a framed image is seen recurring, it usually means that a family has followed the tradition of sharing that same image. Yes, as crazy as this may sound, I think that the Anderson family is related to the Fredrickson family. And this is just a theory of course, not a fact, so not everything will line up perfectly. You see, Ellie's family is sort of like a hub for Pixar's secrets. There have been many, many theorists on the matter, most primarily including the Super Carlin Brothers YouTube channel. But I suppose that I too will get into this long, long, long story. <coughs> Emma Jean. Emma Jean is the name of a woman who is found as the sender of a postcard sent to Carl and Ellie Fredrickson. This card can strangely enough be found in Andy Davis's bedroom, and even stranger, up on his wall. In John Carlin's interview with the director of Up, Pete Docter revealed that Emma Jean was a previous love interest of Carl Fredrickson. He said that before Ellie, he had Emma, and that after he married Ellie, they were all still good friends. And what stumped everybody still to this day is that in Toy Story 3, you see that letter addressed from her to them, on Andy's wall. Why? It's just so out of place and completely random. Not. Nothing is random with Pixar. Once Pete revealed who she was, people sort of stopped trying to figure things out, even though it was only half solved. And today, I'm gonna finish this long-awaited answer. How are these families related? And I'm so excited because it's time to make my favorite thing a family tree. Fun fact, I used Ancestry.com to trace my family back several generations and managed to get 3,500 people on it. Oh, and for those Once Upon a Time fans, don't worry, when Season 6 finishes, I'll be right back on that tree. Ugh, that thing's a mess. Alright, I'm getting distracted. Let's start with the basics. Carl and Ellie Fredrickson are married. Carl had a previous love interest to Emma Jean. Andy Davis is the child of some man and Jennifer Davis. Yes, that is her official name by Pixar. And yes, I realize that there is a very popular theory that she is Emily, the girl from Jessie's past, but it too is just a theory. And her official name sort of goes against that theory. Anyways, other child, Molly Davis. Riley Anderson is the daughter of Jill and Bill Anderson. The Inside Out Essential Guidebook reveals this. The only strange things I noticed when scanning the movie is that Jill's credit card says K. N. Anderson. But I may touch upon that another day. Also, up on the wall, there is a certificate for a man named William Anderson. Bill is short for William, ergo, their names are officially Jill and Bill Anderson. So we have our three separate trees, and now we must find a way to connect Emma Jean to the Davises and Ellie to the Andersons. That is not an easy task at all. As I previously said, recurring pictures are ones that are usually given out to extended family members, so we do know that at the time of Inside Out, Ellie is old, right as Riley is young. Excellent. What are the possible combinations here? Well, 
Ellie can't exactly have children, so that's out of the question, but she can adopt, and we see just how important children are to her and Carl. But we never see or are made aware of any kids in the whole movie, and we just need more to prove that. So let's quickly try the other trees. Is Jen Davis the child of Emma Jean and Carl Fredrickson? Well, that was a bomb I just dropped. Surely many have considered this though, right? Well, finally, we can prove it. And as a matter of fact, we can also place Jill under here too, because it doesn't quite look like she's gonna fit under adopted. Okay, if you're a little bit lost, that's okay. I'll explain this part now. Right now we are trying to prove that Jill and Jennifer are the children of Carl and Emma. Numero uno, the assumption must be made that Emma Jean and Carl Fredrickson actually had a child. The timing for this is fitting, but not fitting like the size of your clothing, more like the fitting of skinny jeans. It works, but it feels a little uncomfortable, unless you're this guy who seems a little too comfortable. But the only jeans we'll be dealing with today are of the Emma kind. You see, Carl is born in 1931, and he and Ellie get married when he's in his 20s or 30s. There is certainly still time to be with Emma Jean, and most definitely to have children, but it just feels a little weird. If these women are in their 40s, it actually does work swimmingly though, and do you know what? They appear to be. So timing, although iffy, still checks out. Numero duo, genetics. Can't forget those. And so I will be frank with y'all. Oops, I, sorry, I intentionally said y'all again. The genetics here match up, but you guys hate it when I deal with genes. So the only genes we'll be dealing with today are of the Emma kind. Irregardless of my deoxyribonucleic puns of repetition, Carl's eye color is identical to Miss Davis's eye color, and it's blue, a rare trait. Their hair color is also the same. When not old, Carl had brown hair. Miss Davis's roots are brown. She just changes her style a lot. So Emma and Carl's children would indeed match the genes that we see, and the time that they take place also fits. And that always helps. But the real question is, why does Andy Davis have a postcard from his grandma and her new husband to his grandpa and his new wife up on his wall? Why is it that important to him? And still, where does Ellie's framed picture in Jill's house fit into all of this? And the question on everybody's mind. Who is Andy's father? And as you'll see, we solved a couple of questions, but now we have three more. This is going to get real messy real fast. We know that Emma Jean's card implies that she is far away and is with somebody else. Andy has pinned it up like it's actually worth something. Why is it there? Who is Emma with now? Great, four questions now. But if I must, here is a brief summarization of what we've covered, or tried to cover so far. After having Jennifer and Jill, Emma and Carl split. Carl then married his childhood BFF. Emma moved on, but as Pete said in John's interview, they remained good friends. And Emma went on to marry… we don't know. But what I find most important right here is that the time they get married and divorced and all that is right in the 50s, according to Pete. And what do we know that happened in the 50s? Woody and his Roundup gang were created. All of this loops back to who his father is, since it's very likely that Andy was given Woody by his missing father. Ugh. This is just way too complicated, but I refuse to back out of this like I have other topics. I'm far too into this one now. It's driving me nutty. Pixar has broken me. And that couldn't be more perfect. And just to clarify, we know that the Andersons are related through Jill and not Bill, as they would have the last name Fredrickson if it were Bill. Jennifer Davis and Jill Anderson, maiden names Fredrickson, are the two children of Emma and Carl Fredrickson. Emma's maiden name is Jean. Divorcing his wife due to unspecified complications, Carl then marries Ellie. They all still remain friends, however. So we now have the not necessarily correct, but best fitting answer to the configuration of these three families. And yes, without getting too into it, this whole family follows the rare trait, and most of them have blue eyes, like Granddaddy Carl. Some people, yes, this includes the Carlin brothers, have questioned why Riley looks so drastically different from her parents. Well, genes can skip generations. This is also seen in Molly Davis, who has similar genes, you know, the blonde and the blue eyes, but her mother doesn't have any of that, and Carl fits the bill with his blue eyes. The only questions we have now are, who is Andy's father? 
who is Emma Jean's significant other, and why does Andy have a letter from his grandma and her new husband to his grandpa and his new wife? Those are the trickiest ones to figure out, and I have no answer. But we can brainstorm for the time being. Losing his father to a clearly recent breakup is something that would take its toll on Andy. Naturally, that's the way with any divorce, especially an obviously nasty one like this. No sign of a father at all. It's almost like Jennifer has wiped the house of everything that was his. And she has. Which makes it nearly impossible to decide who the father is. Sorry, Maury, this is even beyond your capabilities. However, you'll see that I said it's nearly impossible. Nearly. Since Andy has kept such an obscure and random postcard in his room, I have reason to believe that it is somehow linked to his father, and Emma Jean's new love interest. This is just an idea to quickly ponder. Andy's grandparents gave him their postcard to give him hope of seeing his father again, to show him that it was possible for parents who break up to keep happy with each other, that a recovery is a possibility. That's all a boy would need in a situation as such. Yes, that is what I'm going with. And who is Mr. Davis? We all know that he'd keep the last name Davis with him, so all we need to do now is scan all of the Pixar films for someone, anyone, or anything with the last name Davis. Well, naturally, I found absolutely nothing. Maybe figuring out who Andy's dad is simply isn't something that's meant to be. But I'm not going to give up so easily. What I want you, the viewers, to do is scan through the films if you can, and make sure to comment who you think he is. We are looking for someone preferably with blue eyes and brown hair who lives in the Tri-County area. If you cannot find an actual character, do an analysis and scan for anything throughout the movies that says Davis. We can solve this. It needs to be answered, or in the least, solved for this theory. It's possible that it can be Bill Anderson, but timing isn't evidence, it's convenience. And that would be, well, just conniving and deviant of him. The gals would probably kill Bill. And now, who is Emma Jean referring to when she says, we? Who is she with now? This is equally as hard to solve as the strange case of Mr. Davis, but who is it we should be looking for this time? Well, we need to look for an old man with an old woman in a Pixar movie. That is literally all. If you can find that in any of these movies, we can use other strings of evidence to possibly connect everything together again. Now go out and look for Mr. Davis and Emma Jean's significant other. Last but certainly not least, as it was the basis of this entire video, why does Emma's daughter have her stepmom framed in her house? Because she is her stepmom, a major impact on her life, a motherly figure who likely lives closer to her than Emma does, based on the Pixar tree and the wishing you were here line. Finally, I reviewed Up's wedding scene, and to my surprise, I certainly did find a little something. Emma Jean, maybe. If she truly is friends with these people, she is most likely to be at their wedding, and with a new man, right there, in the front row. It's entirely possible. And what's this? A daughter, maybe? Who knows? I will return to this when I have enough information to successfully conclude some theories. So after the many videos by such YouTubers as John and Ben Carlin, Seamus Gorman, and Watso videos, a few months ago I decided to construct my own theory around the concept of Pixar's Emma Jean mystery. I found a framed image of Ellie from Up in Riley's house in Inside Out. Watch that video first by clicking the little white rectangular box that appears in the top right corner of the screen now. But to greatly summarize, the Pixar mystery woman was someone I tied to being a part of a massive family which tied together Toy Story, Up, and Inside Out. And although the concepts of that video are a bit unlikely, that doesn't mean it isn't a fun thing to return to. Because if you haven't already noticed yet with my channel, what I do isn't exactly theorizing, it's more of a story I create and then apply it with evidence. I think that's what the viewers enjoy the most. <laughs> So since this video received many requests to make the follow-up I promised, I feel sort of obligated to do so. So let's start with one of the biggest questions I asked at the end of my video. Who is Andy's dad? Well, I got some, uh, insightful responses. Andy's dad is a peanut. The dad is Woody. That's why Andy is so attached, let's just say Jennifer 
had some fun. Maybe Andy's mum is his dad. What happened is his dad went insane and killed his mum. Now he is wearing her flayed, decaying face to trick Andy. <laughs> oh my god. This is so ridiculous. Andy's dad is obviously Marlon from Nemo. <laughs> Have you seen my son? <laughs> But there were some responses so strange that they actually got me thinking, so indulge me for a moment as I explain a ton of amazingly interconnected but sort of unlikely and bizarre theories by commenters, some of which got a ton of likes. Now, surprisingly, the concept of Al from Al's Toy Barn being the father is intriguing. Dozens of people suggested this in the comments section, and it dawned on me when making the video as well, as, well, Al seems to have direct ties to Woody, in the same way in which I deduced that Andy's father would. The genetics mostly tie together, but common sense people, like Chicken Man plus possibly homicidal Black Widow post insipid misanthrope does not equal Toy Boy. Senselessness is rampant through these comments, but the idea is still quite cool. Now a new topic, something I hadn't thought of when writing the script, but apparently dozens of viewers pointed out, that an old man we see recurring in Pixar movies, aka Gary, Jerry, Ger, Garai, G Jerry, from Jerry, Gary, Jerry's Game, the same man who fixes Woody in Toy Story 2, is an old guy who seemingly fits the bill for Emma Jean's second love interest. However, as some more clever people pointed out, Emma Jean's letter doesn't actually imply a love interest at all, just that she may perhaps be with somebody. So who might that be? Well, hopefully this video will narrow things down for you guys to figure out that one in the comments section. I guess this video is more of just a narrowing things down more than a full-on part two, more like a, a 1.5, just kind of an intermission type theory. But you see, dear viewers, this is an interesting comment right here. This person suggested, and this is a good one, that perhaps Andy's dad left Jennifer because she cheated on him having Molly. This is the single worst possible way for a breakup to happen. Cheating. All of the signs were there. The lack of anything of Andy's dad on the walls, Andy's obsessive tie to his toys, and finally, Molly's abnormal traits. That light blonde hair. Nothing like the rest of her family, but a father, who perhaps may have blonde hair, would produce a daughter with different genes. And if we assume that the breakup was this nasty, then do you know what that means? It means that Jennifer is extremely likely to change both of her children's last names to hers. Meaning that I've been going about this all wrong, and we should not be looking for a man with the last name Davis, but rather something entirely different. Perhaps there were two fathers in this family. This just all reinforces my Black Widow statement from earlier. So, who is the father? Or more accurately, who are the fathers? Bill Anderson? Oh, this just gets creepier and creepier. Now this comment right here is a mind twister. Could Emma Jean be the sister of Ellie? Well, we are never given her maiden name, and the woman in their wedding's audience, who could possibly be Emma, clearly shares genetic resemblances to Ellie, so I don't know. It's likely, but it kind of twists things up for poor Carl and the girls. Moving on to this person who claims that on Andy's shelf, there were signs of some form of Boy Scouts. So could he have ties to Russell? We may never know, but perhaps Russell's dad is never around because he's living an alternate life with the Davis family, or perhaps the Anderson family. I mean, the genes match up. But no, 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 I'd never base a theory around all of this. But the concepts are there, and my intention is to spread ideas for you commenters who may be able to contribute to the solution. And there are many other comments here, which I'll put up on the screen right now, but basically this video was just made as a direct follow-up to my last one, to spread more and more ideas, because we are really close to figuring out how all of these easter eggs are connected. What intrigues me the most is who Russell's parents really are. But I will do that for another day. I promise. Ish.
Warning, before you watch this video, know that it is very different from my usual videos. It's mostly a psychological analysis of a real-life statement by a Pixar writer, and it's less like what I usually do, but I'm sure you've watched Pixar movies before, correct? Hopefully, if you're clicking on this, then you've already seen my Pixar Family Tree video as well. If you haven't, then you need to, to watch this. Also, you can watch part two of it for more info, but basically, we're still figuring out this family tree I made. It ties together Inside Out, Up, and Toy Story, and uses obscurely mind-blowing evidence threads plucked from all three movies. It left some unanswered questions, though, and the other video I made shared some of your ideas. But the big question regarding who Andy's dad is was seemingly answered by a man interviewed by the Super Carlin brothers. Watch their video, it's a stellar mind blow, but something happened afterwards. So today, I'm going to psychologically pick things apart to their near-atomic level, trying to figure out what's happening with all of this. Hello, I'm the Theorizer, and after the Super Carlin Brothers video went live, it went semi-viral as well. The man who they interviewed was told all of the underlying information about Andy's dad by his friend over a chat during lunch, I believe. His friend was one of the guys who worked on Toy Story, like one of the main guys who worked on it. This mind-blowing video quickly caught the eyes of Andrew Stanton, one of the other writers and creators. You see, the Pixar friend who relayed the information to Mike Mozart, the Super Carlin consultant, was in fact Joe Ranft, a Pixar writer who passed away some time ago. Andrew Stanton later posted a tweet that was attempting to refute this massively amazing take on the story, and it went something like this. Complete and utter fake news. Everyone go back to your homes, nothing to see here, folks. Hashtag, I was there. But if it was debunked by him on his Twitter, then why would the man in the Super Carlin Brothers video talk about it and discuss this? Is he lying? No, there's no way. So how do we explain this? We can analyze this tweet in a possible of three different ways. And yes, I'm going to do just that. Either he is telling the truth and he's a bit annoyed with the viral nature of fake news, or his statement's sheer briefness and abruptness could indicate his annoyance at something being revealed that was supposed to be kept secret until Toy Story 4, or perhaps was simply a headcanon of Joe Ranft or a scrapped idea, and would be retconned in Toy Story 4. The third possibility is that he's lying and trying to use reverse psychology to make a joking statement judging from the word choice because he knew the tweet readers would spiral into analysis of it, as the same readers of his tweet are the ones who would do this kind of analysis in the first place. But if he was incredibly smart, however, it could have been double reverse psychology, and his knowledge of how people would analyze his statement was an actual intention in his ultimate decision to write it in the way he did. Based off of his cleverness, I don't think he'd have any reason to go deeper than that, based sheerly in the context with his reasons. He is one of the men who makes those crazy easter egg filled stories at Pixar, and from that, I can say he wouldn't go any deeper than this. So in order to solve my theory, we need to know which it is. Is it the cold hard truth, a cold hard lie, reverse psychology, or double reverse psychology? Which is it? Well first, we have to more analytically look at his word choice. Did he angrily type this fast? Did he angrily type this slowly? Or did he meticulously type this with the specific choice of words? Using a tool known as Echofun, we can view where this tweet was sent from. According to its source code analysis, this tweet was sent at 2.38pm on June 24th, 2017 from his iPhone. So that narrows things down a little bit, as we know that he was on the move and was likely spammed with the video by Super Carlin Brothers fans. But the article he linked in his tweet, however, was by io9, who posted their piece two hours before Andrew Stanton tweeted. Now, two things could be occurring here. Either he saw the article by something as big as io9 as the last straw after the spam, or he simply was made aware of it by their article after he saw it on io9. Problem is, he'd have been spammed with the video, so it makes it far more likely that he took this as the last straw. 
However, that's still two days after getting messages, emails, and tweets directed at him. If he responded the day the Super Carlin Brothers posted it, June 22nd, then it would have indicated that he was obsessively after squashing the idea, likely because it was true. Except he didn't do that. So it's more likely that he was made aware of it starting on the 23rd, one day later. This is the day which, if he responded on, I would have considered normal, but his tweet would have been worded differently in a way that more calmly and maturely states how it was incorrect news. But the fact that it was posted a whole two days later, after io9 posted it as well, indicates to me that his sarcasm is a composition of words very carefully chosen. Even if this makes little sense to some of you, the sheer fact that he tweeted a couple hours after the post from io9 is interesting enough. Or maybe this is just too psychoanalyzed. Since his carefully chosen sarcasm is most likely the case though, and he was on the move due to the factor of his iPhone being the posting platform, it indicates to us that yes, it was more likely not a cold hard truth or lie, but if anything, a cold hard semi-truth as he knew Joe Ranft and the team had this as a possible background story for Andy's dad. So, we've already eliminated the first two, but replaced it with a new one, the semi-truth. But let's look at the reverse psychologies now. Whether he was intending to use the reverse psychology on casual viewers, or the double reverse psychology on the analytical theorists, is a matter of how far he's willing to go. Remember, there's around a 60% chance that he had more than enough time to plan this, and a 70% chance that he had at least some time to plan this, and there's still upwards of a 20% chance that he was using manipulation tactics. His tweet may have been apparently annoyed, but right off the bat I can safely say that he was not intending to spill this message to the minority, the minority being theorists. If he was attempting to use manipulation, he'd be doing it to the majority. The majority being casual movie viewers who may have been convinced by Mike Mozart's sound statements. Since this is 95% the case over the first one, I can safely eliminate the double reverse psychology from the options. So here we are, left with reverse psychology or the semi-lie. So did he intend to make the readers second guess his tweet? Here's where the only thing we can do is check over his wording to see if he's serious or not. If his word choice is seriously intended like this, then it's the semi-lie. If it's more jokingly abrupt, then it's reverse psychology. First sentence is complete and utter fake news. Quite an abrupt way to start it. I'll label this semi-lie for now, but perhaps return to it after the rest of the word analysis. Next sentence is slightly more sarcastic and joking, using a common statement to apply to something where people never left their homes. This is just a common overused joking statement, so it's branded with reverse psychology. Next sentence is nothing to see here, folks, which, when paired with the last two statements, kind of neutralizes everything. It's a mix of both, which is unfortunate for all of this so far, it just keeps things still in the middle, but it's that last thing that was added, that hashtag I was there, that really ends up pushing things in one direction or the other. It's like an end touch of coldness, a very blunt statement, which does, unfortunately, do two different things. The fact that he feels the need to append the statement with this little extra hashtag is indicative of sarcasm, but what it actually reads is indicative of the cold, harsh semi-lie. So which trumps the other? We also have to realize that within the two days, he was the only one on the team to respond to this, further showing how it may have been a bit more coordinated in order to work around something. I mean, the other creators didn't also blurt out rebuttals at random times, it was just him. And since it was something a bit more organized than blunt anger, we now know that there's more of a 90% chance that this all points to the semi-lie. So, that's it. When creating Toy Story, Andrew Stanton and his co-creators likely brainstormed ideas around Andy's family and some backstories, but none really came to fruition or made it into the Pixar canon. At lunch, Joe Ramp told Mike Mozart one of the ideas. It was accepted as his headcanon and he relayed it to the Carlin Bros in the form of a viral video. So nobody is lying here like some assume. Mike Mozart is not and has absolutely no reason to lie. But this whole story about Andy's dad is quite clearly by Stanton's statement, something that is not true, at least not in the canon, because it's a semi-truth. It was an idea. And so finally, the point of this whole psychoanalysis or whatever I'm doing here, 
does it count towards the canonicity of Toy Story? And the answer is no. While it is, in fact, partially correct, it does not apply to the film because despite the flooding evidence, it was never blatantly explained and it was, in fact, subtly disconfirmed by a cryptic Stanton on Twitter. So my point is here, let's stop with the Andy's dad question because quite clearly it was never intended to be a part of the story. But most certainly, we should keep focusing on those other two massive questions I left in part one. Who is Emma Jean with now, and why does Andy have his grandparents' postcard pinned on his wall? These are things that writer and director Pete Docter publicly stated were of importance, so let's lean into these ones instead. And I've already started this off. I said in that first video that the couple in the front row of Carl and Ellie's wedding is most likely Emma Jean and her new love interest, so please look for an old couple in any Pixar film or short film with these shared genetic traits, especially those eye colors, and please think about that card on his wall. Ratatouille is one of those Pixar movies that really radiates with untold backstories. Why does Alfredo Linguini have an American accent in France, and Anton Ego a British one? Who is the woman at the beginning of the film? How does Remy control Linguini? I've had unbelievable amounts of fun with these questions, and in my opinion, formed one of my best videos. But unfortunately, it had a robot voice speaking over it, it had certain parts that made no sense, and certain parts that were debunked. Ugh, oh dear, we can't have that. So today I'm bringing you a revised theory, where I take an older video of mine and improve it. <laughs> Hello, I'm The Theorizer, and this is my most exciting movie to cover. I love it. Let's do this. Right now, I will be going over all of the evidence I concluded in the original video, and discuss my theory in a better way. But before I start, a couple of months ago, the Super Carlin Brothers made quite a similar video to mine, but I won't deviate into their conclusion. I will stay within my original boundaries. Anton Ego is a food critic who has a very tragic, but entirely untouched upon, backstory. This is the main point I made in my original video, but after what I found today, I am retracting that statement to make a new one. Anton Ego has an extremely tragic past, more so than I previously believed, and this newer, more tragic solution fits without anything that I can see to debunk it. Anton Ego's mother, in his flashback scene, is the exact same woman from the beginning of the film. Boom. Why? Let me explain in great, great detail why I have concluded this to be the case. This flashback has an umbrella leaned up against a wall, a reference to the one Mabel mistakes for a shotgun. By the way, this old lady's confirmed name is Mabel. Both houses have a chair with absolutely identical patterns, the exact same structures, and very similar styles, but these pieces of evidence are only skimming the surface. The cabinet they both have has identically patterned doors, and the structure is completely identical. Just look at them. Look! Stoves? Very, very close to the same. The structure of the fireplaces in both houses are the exact same. It goes up, out, curves, up, bar across the top, bar going vertically inside, they're the exact same. What really confirms the fireplaces, though, are the curtain thingies that go across the top. They are the same in both places. This isn't the kind of thing that's a coincidence. Want more proof of this? Anton Ego's silhouette is found right there on her wall, with his pointy head, protruding nose, and teeny tiny glasses. The floor in their houses are identical, with red and brown hexagonal patterns. The same goes for the mat colors and patterns, wall colors, and door styles and colors. If you got a million dollars for every time I said identical, you'd be a millionaire. Okay, I suppose that's a stupid comparison, but nonetheless, they're identical. And you could argue that Pixar is just reusing similar models to save animating time, but, but one, this is Pixar we're dealing with, and two, there are far too many similarities for it all to be this coincidental. Also, on the wall next to Anton's silhouette, there is a framed image of a young Mabel and a husband. The young Mabel looks identical to Mrs. Ego. They live on a farm in rural France, with a rock wall along the inner yard, just like in Mabel's yard. 
Also outside, they have identically placed and colored oak trees, which by the way, do grow in rural France. The vines that grow around the doorway are the same at the old woman's house. The worn-in pathway outside her front door is the same. All of it. The only difference that is noticeable is that the house appears to be entirely mirrored from the flashback. What is the symbolism behind that? I didn't know before in my last video, but I do now, and I'll get into that in a minute. The genetics comparing Mabel to Ego are on point. The eye colors, hair colors, earlobes, handedness, and everything else is similar. Mabel also has the same genes as Anton's mom, the same ears, eyes, hair color, and handedness. This makes them more likely than not to be the same person. The timing matches up excellently as well. Ego is in his 50s, this woman is in her 80s. This Ego is around 10 in the flashback, this mother is in her 30s, as apparent by her generalized features. Perfect timing for her to be a mother to him. Like, it couldn't be more perfect. So, I can conclusively say that Mabel is the legitimate mother of Anton Ego, but how does this amazing revelation change the whole flow of the story? Well, there is lots more to cover, including that terribly sad part I am promising. Mabel is obsessed with Gusto. His books, his cooking, everything he has. Mabel's wedding picture portrays the groom as a large man with facial features that match, you guessed it, Gusto. So is Mabel's husband Gusto? And this is where things get extremely awesome. But unfortunately, this was the only part of my theory that was debunked because A. Linguini's mother is named Renata, not Mabel, and, you know, Gusto is his father, so it, it wouldn't really work there. B. Renata died, unlike Mabel, who is alive and ticking. So the only solution is that they aren't the same person. So then, how does it all work? In my original theory, I made the major claim that they were the same person, but their different names go against this and hard. I thought I was so close, so close, but still too far. Fortunately, things clicked right back into place as I began writing this script. Here is my conclusion. Gusto and Mabel had a child, Anton. The genetics match up perfectly when it comes to Gusto and Ego. Some time then passes, and Gusto leaves Mabel for Renata, whom he becomes the boyfriend of. But Mabel loved him to an obsessive point, and she continued to obsess over his shows and cookbooks. She is old and crazy. Accidentally, Renata and Gusto had Linguini, but Renata never told Gusto, as they say in the film. And this is why Ego hates both Linguini and Gusto, because Gusto left his mom for a newer model, but then Gusto created a replacement to what Anton was supposed to be, his father's successor. Feel that? Your perception of reality just blew apart into trillions of subatomic pieces. Anton's hatred of his father makes his critical opinion very biased, and he subtracts a star from their restaurant. This depressing moment is when Gusto can't handle it anymore. His own son has broken his heart, and Gusto dies. There's no way a chef would die from a bad review. But all of this piled up, and his son reviews him badly? That's the cherry on top of a crappy situation. Gusto dies. At the end of Ratatouille, Ego says that he finally realizes what Gusto meant when he said that anyone can cook. This means that he has known him for a very long time. Renata probably disliked Ego for being the son of a previous woman, and then hated him for killing her boyfriend. She never revealed any of this in her letter to Skinner. In her eyes, and possibly Mabel's, Ego was a disgrace to both women, inadvertently killing his own father with little to no remorse. And why didn't she reveal to Gusto that she had Linguini? He already had a son. It would have been a bit too much to take in. As we see, he dies easily. Gotta be careful there with those shocking reveals. The only one who knew any of this was Ego. This is the reason he despises Gusto and really hates Linguini. Linguini, without even knowing it, made Anton jealous. Ego shows it. His last name is not Gusto because he left them and changed it. As we have already established, he wanted to be as far away as possible from them. He changed his last name to remind himself of his father's uncontrollable ego, Gusto, darker and far less jolly than meets the eye. But he remains in the food business being a highly respected critic. Anyone can cook, a motto meant for ego, but that's only a possibility. 
And finally, what I believe to be the crowning clue. Ego's mom has the exact same recipe that the restaurant has for Ratatouille. Exact same? How odd. How specific that they named this movie Ratatouille. Why that? Surely not just because it's a dish they made, but it's because of the impact it has on this broken family, reuniting the once perfect little bunch. Anton Ego, a food critic driven by the betrayal of his father, the insanity of his mother, the arrogance of his father's new girl, and the jealousy of his half-brother. A man who only wanted a family, but it all fell apart when fame hit them like a freight train. Gusto succumbed to another woman. Boom. Small family crumbles apart. This is like literally the opposite of the conclusion in my last video. Pixar builds a happily divorced family, and then a wickedly divorced family. It's very sad when you think about it. And we know from all of the deleted scenes that Gusto wasn't just depressed from the review. He was an all-around depressed and angered man. Jolly at times, but unpredictable at others. He has no reason to act this way. He has a great life. Or so we're led to believe. These scenes actually caught me off guard at first, but... Now they don't. They support my theory, and now we know why Gusto is a sad guy. Not a bad guy. Just a sad guy. Finally, that point I made about his mirrored memory. Why is it flipped? Well, Anton has led a pessimistic life full of hatred. I mean, it isn't like you can actually blame him, but still, he has lived it nonetheless. He's like the anti-Gusto, extremely thin and dark, while Gusto is extremely fat and jolly. Jack Skellington Santa Claus, you may say. And yes, that's a, that's a nod to a future theory I may be doing. Anyways, his mirrored memory. Mirrors symbolize countless things, but most prominently, they symbolize self-evaluation and reflection when dealing with the consequences of your actions. Ego has plenty to reflect on. His killing of his father, his amplified pessimism, his life. His whole life is something to reflect upon. For God's sake, his workplace is shaped like a coffin, and he looks like a stick figure. Too much guilt, only something to fuel the fire. Reflection. I'm starting to think that the only not sad thing to come out of this movie's backstory is the fact that Colette and Linguini's new restaurant is now world famous. You can tell it's famous if Riley's mother reads about it. Now that we've covered every single thing that there is to cover, it's time for me to make the one. The only. Timeline. Because if you're still worried about the timing of all of this, don't worry, it checks out perfectly. Ratatouille is one of those Pixar movies that takes place right when it's released, so 2007. This means that when we go all the way to the start of our timeline, Gusto and Mabel are born in the year 1927, or sometime around there. They get married at an unspecified point quite some time later. When they're around their mid-twenties, they have a child named Anton. He is born around the year 1952. All of these dates are calculated estimates, by the way. Renata is also born, sometime between Gusto and Anton's births. After Anton gets a little bit older, his father leaves Mabel for Renata, who becomes his girlfriend. This makes Mabel forever obsessed with the tolling loss of her husband, and naturally it infuriates Anton. But what really sets him off is when he learns that his father's girlfriend has a child. His father doesn't know. The birth of Linguini in around 1972 gives Anton a definite reason to have a personal vendetta against that family and the restaurant. He poorly reviews his father's meal and kills him accidentally. He always goes on about how he doesn't think anyone can cook, and it's simply an exaggerated and understandably biased response. Gusto's death is anywhere from 0 to 15 years after Linguini's birth, so Gusto died at age around 55 to 70. 15 to 20 years after his death, Renata dies too, and Linguini begins working at the restaurant in 2007. It all fits. This is why I love Ratatouille. If you haven't watched my other Ratatouille video, yes, I have yet another one, I discussed how Gusto too could have been controlled by a rat. And now, I have this theory to fuel that one. Gusto lived on a rural farm initially, the same farm that Remy's dad has lived on. Is it possible that Remy's dad loved cooking and Gusto betrayed him after a tragic breakup? It would be why the dad is so vengeful. I illegitimately diagnosed Linguini with autonomic dysreflexia, and it is hereditary. And Skinner's lawyer said that he found a rodent hair in Gusto's chef hat. So, this may be for another day.
So after my last Ratatouille theory, people had some questions regarding my timeline, and of course I made the promise to delve into the mysteries of the rats. But maybe the rat concept will be for another day, because today I want to explain an alternate route to my whole video. Hello, I am the Theorizer, and this is probably my favorite theory which I've ever made. But there was something incomplete about it. I want to clear a few things up. This timeline I presented at the end was not accurate, and it wasn't meant to be. It was just to put everything into perspective. It could vary by 20 years or so, and still work in many ways. People were telling me how Gusteau died only a couple of years prior to the main film, and how that totally fractured my timeline, but it doesn't. As I said, it's extremely variable. But then, I got comments from a few people, and they mentioned something so interesting. Now, I had pondered over this point when editing the video, but I didn't really take it anywhere, as I'd already set in stone the concept of father and son. But when these people said that they could be brothers, I felt like hopping back on the concept. And since I'm now making a part two, I figured I'd bring back my ideas on this. So Gusto and Ego can very well be brothers. It fits the fractured timeline even better than before. It makes even more sense when dealing with how the mother would favor one over the other, and the fighting and competition between brothers is far more believable than a father and son food battling to death. And literally every single point I made in that original video can be summed up by this as well. Now, we see no evidence in the old woman's house to say that Gusto was another son, but we do see that person who I mentioned to be Mabel's husband, who looks strikingly like Gusto, but not exactly, which is why I believe it to be far more likely that this is Ego and Gusto's father. This is just getting deeper and deeper. This thread of comments specifically nails it. Everybody who participated in it had excellent ideas. This person pointed out how Gusto said that the Ratatouille recipe was a disaster and how it could have been because he was trying to replicate his mother's original recipe, and that was why he was excited when Remy nailed it. This person also identified how the motto, anyone can cook, could also apply to them being brothers, as Mabel and Gusto could have been fantastic chefs, but Ego didn't fit in. This also makes sense as to why he may name himself Ego after how he saw his family. It makes sense as to why he may hold resentment, and also why Mabel is constantly obsessing over her dead son, something much more likely than a heartbreaking hubby. The fact that Ego didn't really know who Linguini was in the movie was the only real thing that debunked my older theory, but this here makes total sense, as well as the fact that Ego has a British accent. He left them and moved away to England, perhaps? Linguini's American accent is of course due to the fact that his mother likely didn't raise him in France, I mean. French clearly isn't his first language. I was initially planning to tie Renata into being Emma Jean from my Inside Out theory, as the wishing you were here statement could imply France but that would make things a little too mind-blowing. And again, there were many of you saying how the houses were coincidentally the same, but they are not coincidental. Some of the reused models, okay, but the silhouette, concept of the old woman watching the show, and the literally identical house, from the vines around the door, to the rock wall, to the everything, proves it to be more likely than not. So yeah, sorry this is very short, but I really wanted to finally put a successful close on this theory. As far as the rat concept goes, maybe that'll be for another day, as there isn't a whole lot of evidence to say a whole lot of things. But I kind of just wanted to share this alternate route to the Gusto theory, as I think it's far more likely that they're brothers, rather than father and son. See you soon. <laughs> Lily, get off. Lily, get off. No, no, no. <laughs> it's gonna make a great blooper. <laughs> oh my god, my cat. That's so stupid. When people ask me which videos they should watch if they want to understand my channel, I direct them to three separate theory trilogies I've made. I direct them to my theories on Syndrome from The Incredibles, I direct them to the even more deep trilogy of Monsters Inc. theories, and of course, my channel's OG bombshell, the now trilogy of Ratatouille theories. These 
theories are some of the most fun things I've ever had the great pleasure of creating, analyzing, writing, discovering, and deconstructing. For those who haven't seen it and don't know what I'm talking about, back on New Year's Day 2016, I posted what, at the time, was considered my most detailed video to date. It basically revolved around the character from Ratatouille, known as Gusto, and how the old woman from the beginning of the film was his wife. And even better, that their son was Anton Ego, and everything is tied together in his flashback scene. There were a few holes though, so I waited 11 months before revising the theory and coming to a slightly different conclusion that prompted far less holes. Basically, I concluded that Gusto was actually Ego's brother. I then took this theory and found even smaller holes, so I just made a very short sequel video early 2017 to fill them. But the process of doing that altered the entire flow of the whole theory without me even acknowledging that the timeline has entirely shifted by decades. So so in today's video, I will finalize everything, wrap up my ideas, and present one final timeline of events to satisfy me and those who were left hanging by a short and underviewed mini-theory excuse of a part two. Hello, I'm the Theorizer. Before the epic timeline, I'll just recap part two's central point. Basically, everything I said in the revised part one still stands, except for the fact that Anton Ego is not Gusto's son, but rather his brother. Part two was mostly just a comment review of my viewers who brought up things that I'd already been thinking for a while. Part one's timeline was short and incorrect, as was the family tree I illustrated. But recently, as I've been looking at it all again, I acknowledge the stunning visual similarities between Gusto and Ego. They're very close in age, and other than the fat plaguing one and the skinny plaguing the other, they look identical. Their genetics. In fact, they're completely identical hair colors and hair consistencies, and if I had a shred of proof for it, I'd be prompted to brand them as twins. The only difference is their last name and accents, which I confirmed was caused by Ego's resentment and moving to, likely, England for a while. The man in the photo on Mabel's shelf also looks like a mix between them, hence why, after seeing another photo that confirmed she married him, I branded him their father. Same fat as Gusto, same elongated cranium as Ego. So today, let's get to this thing. So the movie takes place in the year 2007, and if we backtrack with estimated dates, such as the assumption that Ego and Gusto would be around 60, that places their birth dates at 1947, and assuming Mabel is around 80, that would put her birth date at 1927. So starting in the year 1927, or sometime in the 1920s, Mabel is born, as is her future husband. They grow up, and in the mid to late 1940s, they have Anton Ego and Auguste Gusto. Now, I'm not actually sure if it was Ego or Gusto who changed their name to make it more celebrity-like. I mean, both last names are pretty quirky. Ego is a reference to one's own self-importance, as I claimed was how Anton saw his family, and Gusto is just a random anagram of Augusta, his first name. Regardless, this family has one of those two last names, and I'll go with them being the Gusto family for this timeline's simplicity. As children, Ego and Gusto's mother Mabel loves to cook. She absolutely loves it, and she cooks for her children. She might even be a famous chef herself. Her husband, I'm not sure what happens, but considering we never see him in the movie, the assumption is that he dies sometime when Ego and Gusto were children, or young adults. This is detrimental to the family in general, and might even be what prompted Ego to leave home. But as children, Ego and Gusto are fed delicious meals by their mother, wonderful ratatouille included. They love it, and it's a nostalgic, feel-good dish. Gusto displays a similar aptitude for the culinary arts to that of his mother, and this makes Ego feel, well, rather distraught. The one thing he loves is food, and he's less talented in the area of preparing it. All he can do is critique it, but well. 
his criticality grows into general animosity towards those he perceives as being egotistical, and as an adult, he leaves out of spite to become a professional critic of the art form he desperately wishes he was successful at replicating. This, by the way, may all sound like an elaborate fanfiction, but it is not. It's entirely my construction of the psychologies of characters, my logical reasoning, and the evidence we see sprinkled all throughout the movie. Ego leaves. We know this because his childhood memory was French, but his accent sounds borderline English. Regardless, he left and pursued the art form of criticism. As Gusteau grew as a world-famous chef, Ego grew more and more spiteful, ranking him as one of the world's best critics. Many people likely had no idea that Ego was even Gusteau's brother. Gusteau even releases an Anyone Can Cook book, implying anyone, even Ego, can cook. But Ego perceives this as passive aggression and slams it in the interview we see at the beginning of the film. Only at the end of the film does he joyously proclaim he understood what Gusto meant. From that point forward, his life changed, but at this time, he was depressed as hell. In his early 30s, Gusto meets a woman named Renata, whom he falls deeply in love with, but something happens that causes them to break apart. Most likely she needs to move somewhere for some given reason, and this is sad for Gusto. Based off of Linguini's very American accent, we can safely deduce that they broke up because Renata moved to America and had Linguini, unbeknownst to Gusto, who had no idea she was even pregnant at the time. Maybe she even left because she knew she was going to have Linguini and she didn't want anything to interfere with his work. Linguini ends up being born sometime around the early 1980s. Linguini grows up in America and they move back to France when Renata gets sick, as she wants her son to live the life he deserves with his father and she molds his life around an ideal from that point forward. She gives him the letter and ends up dying. Gusteau learns of her tragic death, probably through the newspaper, and then one fateful day, only a few years before the movie takes place, Ego returns from England and utterly slams Gusto's dish, leading to the obese old Gusto to die of, quote, heartbreak, in what I'm theorizing to be more ways than one. Death by review doesn't really happen, especially not superficially like we're shown, but his brother, returning from England just to deeply destroy him, and just after learning of the death of his true love, it truly does kill him. Gusto thinks he has nobody, doesn't even know of Linguini, and he dies. Mabel cuts all ties to her remaining son because of this, and Ego's depression only grows. He then becomes spiteful of everyone, reviewing things with cutting word choices and hatred. A few years later, Linguini decides to follow through with his mother's thoughts for a career at Gusto's restaurant, and we see the events of the movie transpire. That's it. The family tree looks like this. And yes, it was normal for people back in the 1940s and earlier to have kids immediately as they marry at age 20. Just like Mabel and her husband, this timeline's dates are so unbelievably accurate that it isn't even funny. This timeline's dates are bang on with only a variability of around two or five years, which is a million times more accurate than that old timeline I made, and it all makes brilliant sense. The movie transpires, and Remy notices that the meal known as Ratatouille has uniquely written ingredients and instructions in the cookbook. He knows how to design it in the perfect way, because he's lived in Mabel's attic for so long as he watched her cook. He knows how Ego would like it, because Remy knows who Ego is. He sees that the recipe is wrong in Gusteau's book, because Gusteau failed to replicate his mother's perfect dish. But Remy... Remy is a transcendent little rat. In fact, I might even be prompted to say that he's the reincarnation of Auguste Gusteau and was reborn into this world purely for the task of saving the family he just so happened to live in the attic of. Gusteau's unfinished business. Remy even sees Gusteau as a ghost of his past. But I won't go much further with that whole reincarnation idea, at least not now. Ego is shocked at the brilliant nostalgia he feels after eating the ratatouille, and the meal forces him to remember the love and impact of his mother and brother, and it completely rises him from his clouded depression by the end of the film. And I mean, like, seriously, why would recalling a food you ate when hurting your knee make you change your life's philosophy, unless it had a deeper tie? I even thought it was implied that his mother had gone so far as to have died. So, perhaps Mabel ended up dying after her house was destroyed, all those memories gone. 
And we know Gusto died of heartbreak, so... Heredity. In my old video, I say that everything was identical to Mabel's house except for the main room, which is almost mirrored. I think that's untrue. I think it was just the back door we got to see in Ego's flashback, which is why the room looked mirrored. They barely show the back door, but when they do, it looks intensely similar. As you can see, I do love to obsess over things that don't have much impact. It's fun. And Pixar puts things like a framed man on Mabel's shelf there. They animate it. They have instructions to do so. They build little stories like this into their films. They've confirmed that they do this, and I'm here to solve them. In fact, maybe I'll do Skinner's past next. This theory is done. It's perfect the way it is. Another Pixar theory trilogy complete. Now I'll move on to 2019. This year has been so much fun for making theories. In fact, based off of audience reception on my lore theories, here's a little calendar of my channel's progress through my time of making theories on YouTube. I love making statistics like this because I'm nerdy. But YouTube's been dampening my channel's views and really everything, which makes it harder to get said theories to the very people subscribed to me. I confirmed this problem with them, but there's nothing they're willing to do to fix it. So make sure to click the subscribe button below because it makes sure YouTube gets you the video. Oftentimes it just isn't enough though, so they recommend that you also click the little bell icon and choose the all button under the notifications pop-up. This specific trilogy is over, but I hope to do more Ratatouille soon, because I do love this movie. Maybe more on Remy's tie to Gusto, because I've just opened a can of worms to explain all other cans of worms. Until then, I'm the Theorizer. Are you prepared for perhaps the most elaborate and over-the-top analysis I have ever done? No, seriously, I don't think you can handle the pure depth of this. This is Finding Nemo, a Pixar film, and for the sake of the near meme-worthy complexity addiction I have, I've analyzed every single minor detail seen in this film and its 2016 sequel just so that I can extrapolate animated plot holes into a gargantuan horror story hidden between the lines. If you're new here, that's great, but you have to be open to this kind of thing, because Finding Nemo tells basically the whole life story of the Sherman family family without the characters even saying a word. I have spent hours upon hours triangulating the location of P. Sherman's dentist office from the view of Sydney out the window. I have analyzed every single thing hidden on calendars and posters in the corners of his office's room, and I have delved so deep into my own theories on top of theories that the resolution becomes one of the most difficult to explain things I've built in my life. So without further ado, here's the story of Philip Sherman, his brother, and his amazing amazingly insane niece, Darla, who is the crucial portal to the nether side of this movie. Hello, I'm the Theorizer, and I'm aware that people have speculated on the origins of characters like Darla. I mean, Pixar's really asking for it when they go and put P. Sherman's photograph of her in Finding Dory's Marine Life Institute. Oh, you didn't know about that? Well, even if you did, that doesn't even scratch the surface of this colossal iceberg. I've cut myself off from viewing all other theories on Darla, aside from that one the Super Carlin brothers did a while back, which, by the way, was some awesome in-depth speculation, but I'm tackling the whole entire Sherman family, every aspect of them, every detail available, every source known to man. P. Sherman's backstory, his life story, his brother, yes, and the inherited dentistry occupation. So let's look at every tiny detail seen in every office, be it P. Sherman or the Institute, because we might begin to piece together just a fragment of this elusive tale. So let's start off by getting a basis of P. Sherman's little dentist rooms. From here on out, we'll be calling him Philip, because that is his name. You can tell this by looking at the detailed certificates on his waiting room's wall, or by scouring the internet for a Portuguese 144p video copy of Finding Nemo's 2003 official guidebook, 
Hold on, I'm saving that for later. His name is Philip Sherman. So Philly over here has his little aquarium. He has lots of children's drawings on his walls and many certificates. He has lots of marine diagrams, marine art, and marine paraphernalia in general, as well as a few posters encouraging flossing and brushing teeth. When you really take the time to zoom and enhance, these posters seem to be produced by an association composed of dentists and piano tuners interesting combination. Dr. Sherman also has an incomprehensibly important uh, calendar of appointments on his wall, which is basically the metaphysical key to everything. He has some brochures to Maui and Emeryville, which is Pixar's headquarters, and finally, he has some unintelligible notes posted all around. But right next to the fish, he has three framed photographs. One of his boat, constantly referred to as the Aussie Flosser, if you observe carefully. The other photos include the main one we see of Darla Sherman's seventh birthday, where she murdered Chuckles the Goldfish. And the other, final photo, is of Philip receiving a large Golden Tooth Award in his slightly younger years. So aside from the little x-rays, garbage cans, toilets, and other unimportant dentist objects, is there anything else? Yes. He has a waiting room. And oh, these details are utterly crucial. We'll get to the theory in just a second. His waiting room has his certificates, Barbara, his receptionist, and it has a bunch of Easter egg toys on the ground for children to play with, like Buzz Lightyear. It has plenty of magazines and newspapers, some with very important details on them, like the one this child's mother reads, which literally has Philip's advertisement on it. Inception much? In the sequel film, Finding Dory, we also get to see a lot of details in various offices within the Marine Life Institute. Now, the famous Ultimate Pixar Theory timeline is highly controversial, I'm sure you've heard of it. Even amongst Pixar's very own staff, it's controversial. But nobody would question whether or not the first film takes place within the same universe as the second one. Like, um, it's a direct sequel. It obviously takes place in the same world. So I will take evidence within these two films and cross them over, but not from any other external source. Famous little inexplicable easter eggs like Darla Sherman being on the cover of Molly Davis's magazine in Toy Story 3, that is just as I said, an easter egg. The picture itself, as you can see, is the one from Darla entering her uncle Philip Sherman's office, where no camera was available to actually like take this shot, ergo it's not relevant here. Darla's a different person in that universe, or maybe it's completely irrelevant altogether. Anyways, in Finding Dory, we can see a lot of cool details all around, including a calendar I'll get to momentarily. We see lots of notes, lots of details, and a jaw-dropping reveal that Darla knows people working here. Because in the quarantine office, we see Darla. No, not just Darla, but the same picture of Darla that Dr. Sherman had in his office. The person who put that there knows the Sherman family, but we still don't have enough evidence for a closer connection. The Super Carlin brothers at this point came to a very similar conclusion because of this bizarrely located photograph, but I'm not halting quite yet. That's mostly all of the details we see in the Institute. There's not many of value since we don't actually see the Sherman family in this film. Shockingly enough, however, Philip was supposed to make a cameo appearance in this film. Yes, flabbergasting, I know. Where on earth would they put him here? Well, that's just the question we need to answer. His voice actor unfortunately passed away, so they couldn't put him in the film, which also means Philip had a speaking role, an importance. But again, we'll connect the dots in a moment, because there's one final detail we can find in the short film released with The Incredibles that can possibly connect things together further. Now, I know I said I wouldn't be interfilm Easter egging, but this isn't really an Easter egg at all, because the short film Bounden physically takes place in this Finding Nemo universe. Now, it looks like Australia, but it actually isn't. I think they say it's Western America. I normally would analyze the plants and animals scene, but the ridiculously analytical depth you're about to see is why I don't have the time to analyze this short film. Anyways, it has come to my attention thanks to the short film's audio commentary that the character whose arm is grabbing the sheep to shear him is none other than Dr. Philip Sherman himself. Halt! 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 What?! Oh yes, and get this, his love of nature trumps his love of dentistry by a mile. The amount of evidence for this in Finding Nemo alone is baffling. Dr. Sherman is a naturalist. It's his favorite possible dream and hobby to deal with nature and the creatures inside of it. 
His calendar has diving under the Sunday, which is the day he captured Nemo with his pal, who I'll get to in a moment. So he loves diving and boating with his Aussie flosser. His arm is the one used to shave sheep in the American West, which could possibly be more evidence pointing to how he traveled to California, aside from the fact that he was supposed to be in Finding Dory. Additionally, he's basically a mock of Steve Irwin, what with his Australian nature, his catchphrase of crikey, his naturalism, and all of his personality. He goes so far as to order his tank fish from eBay and mail orders. He cares about them all deeply, his posters and everything in his dentist rumor of a marine nature, as well as one of them featuring presumably a koala. He gives his niece fish, which she intriguingly is obsessed over, and he grabs struggling fish every time he goes out diving. So, all of this is incredibly important for what we're about to solve. Because in my recent obsession with delving into Philip's mind, I was led to a guidebook known as the Finding Nemo Official Guidebook 2nd Edition. It contains tons of information on the film, as well as two pages on the humans, which I became desperate to see for the sake of this video's accuracy. I didn't want to spend a few weeks for an unreliable Amazon order to come in, but all of the false PDFs of it online were riddled with malware. I I knew I needed some key details before making any sort of outlandish claim like Darla's parentage or nationality. I browsed the internet deeper than ever, and I found a website of a Pixar fan who took brief screen images of each of the pages. I got half the details on the pages I needed, but the other half were still hidden. I got key details like Philip loving to go diving with his dentist friends, and I got to see his certificates up close, but I needed more. So I scavenged for the guidebook on the depths of YouTube and found a Portuguese version. It happened to also be the first edition, not the second, but research tells me that these books have the same information, just rearranged and with some bonus stickers at the end. The video was low quality and the pages turned fast, but I managed to capture the moment of each page's full view, and I took it to Photoshop where I digitally enhanced it. I got half the remaining information from Google Translate. Key details, such as how Philip is a famous Australian dentist. This makes sense, as he even pulled one of the Prime Minister's teeth midway through Finding Nemo. It also states that 40 Two Wallaby Way is a family business, implying the dentist's office is indeed the location of that address and not his house. Who knows though, maybe he lives nearby as well. Then again, he always comes in at 9 o'clock, which is apparently late, despite the receptionist Barbara being fine with it and Peach knowing he'll be in at exactly 9. But he says he's late. That says more about him than anything. Anywho, it also says dentistry at this location goes as far back as his great great-grandfather from 1895. Well, that's as far as I could make out. Like, seriously, if any of you have this guidebook in English, tell me. It says he uses dentistry as a gateway to his true passion of marine life, and his office shows it. I already realized this, but then the last bits of info got so unbelievably blurry that two very helpful Brazilian viewers helped me translate it on Twitter. Users at 12JGY and at LucasMA83912255 helped out by viewing the words as a collective whole instead of individually like Google Translate. There was only a single paragraph left. I tried working it more with Photoshop to no avail. They managed to make out something that it said along the lines of Darla going to school, being in second grade, and shaking fish bags of the fish she loves. Piecing it together, I managed to make out that she is in grade two at a fictional Sydney school known as Waltzing Matilda Primary School. It took 20 hours, but I managed to peg down Waltzing Matilda as being a famous Australian song with no school named this that I could find. So why is this all important? Because in my rush to agree with the Super Carlin Brothers theory that Darla is American and her parents work at the Marine Life Institute, I forgot to acknowledge that she does hiss through her braces a forming Australian accent. Things like, fish in my hair, and twinkle twinkle little star. I agree with the notion that she's directly tied to the Institute, but I think it's inverted. And this is where the mind blow descends into brains galore. By this point, I have 17 pages of notes. Over the top, you must now agree with me. But this is all stuff Pixar has distinctly put in their film, and key details they've intentionally put in their guidebook, which zero people have analyzed this thoroughly, aside from that awesome video by the Carlin Bros. It's also said in either the book or or some other detailed location, that Philip gave her the shirt that reads Rock and Roll Girl. 
The thing with this girl, the thing that prompts me to say that she isn't often around her uncle, is that the last time she visited was on her birthday a year prior, when she murdered Chuckles the goldfish. Annual visits, huh? Sounds like a vacation. I was even inclined to say that the second diver with Philip, whose identity I was dead set on figuring out, was her father. Until this damn guidebook implies it to be a dentist friend. So you may ask, is the book canon? Well, it has high-res images of the certificate seen on Sherman's wall, and it is official, so yes. But my theory is only the beginning. It has only set the evidence. I mean, all of it, but the evidence nonetheless. It even mentions in the book how Darla gets a special discount on braces, and in the film, Philip does fiddle with them, so he clearly is her primary orthodontist, but she still has a bit of a clear separation from him, and doesn't see him too often. Why is this? Well, I might get more into that info within the next week so I can actually have time to edit the video, but before this video gets too long for me to edit, I can say I think there's some separation issues with her parents. Clearly her last name implies that it must be her father who is a brother to Philip Sherman. And while it is implied he dives with dentist friends, the symmetry and intrigue of this second blue diver who photographs Marlin like a tourist implies to me that Darla lives in Sydney with her mother, has a divorced father who lives in California where he works at the Marine Life Institute, and once a year Darla gets to spend it all with that side of the family, because Darla's daddy did something. She values fish like she rarely gets them from the people she looks up to. See what I mean? This common belief system is inverted when the guidebook gets involved. Theories by the Carlin brothers, Reddit, everyone, it gets inverted. The implied divorce, violent little girl, family living locations, all of it. Inverted but maintained. Darla's fascination with fish, including piranhas, intrigues me. Or how she just showed up to Dr. Sherman's office without a parent present like they just left. I don't know about you, but I'm starting to feel empathy for a serial fish killer. This might take a lot of theorizing and writing to do, but rest assured I know what I'm doing with this boatload of evidence I've gathered. As soon as I can, I'll get out the next video continuing this, where I'll not only piece more and more puzzle parts together, but I also found a foolproof way to literally triangulate the exact location of the dentist's office and the Marine Life Institute on real maps. I found P. Sherman 42 Wallaby Way, Sydney. And not jokingly or half-baked like those incorrect addresses you see people going to online. This is real. This is its real but still fictional location based off the angle by which the window looks across Sydney Harbor. Next Friday I'll try as fast as I can, but I've never made such huge videos before. So much data. I even think that the piano and dentist company making those posters for Sherman's office might be a part of it all. The Carlin brothers made the assumption that one of Darla's parents is a rock star, based on Sherman's oversized shirt he gave her. And I agree, to the extent that her father could be an ex-pianist after the recent divorce. Opera house, famous family business, all of it is proven. The year the film takes place, the family tree hidden within it, the errors of calendars seen in both movies, and the internet's assumptions are all proven to be half correct in one of the best things I've ever done in my life. Sad, I know, my life. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Sherman family analysis of Finding Nemo. This thing's just getting deeper and deeper. Last week we began this enormous theory by scouting out every possible speck of evidence seen in Dr. Philip Sherman's dentist office, and the many offices of the Marine Life Institute from Finding Dory. We also connected a few dots and began to speculate who Darla's parents might be. We dissected both films in the Finding Nemo Essential Guidebook, effectively proving that Phil Sherman is a naturalist, and that the Pixar short bound in might take place in these films' universe. Last time, we left off on the cliffhanger of how Darla's parents might be divorced, with her father living in America and her mother living in Sydney. Make sure you've seen it, I'll make it easier for you by placing a little white box in the top right corner of the video now, which, if you click it, will take you to part one. Because things are getting more and more surgical than ever today, as I piece together the tragic tale of Darla's family and triangulate the geographical location of P. Sherman's dentist office. Oh god, what has my life become?
Hello, I'm the Theorizer, and welcome if you're new, but also, I'm sorry for the depth I'm about to go into this. No sane person could willingly do this for fun, but luckily this is my job. So before we meticulously string together our list of obscure details, we should get to the most major but random detail out of the way first the physical location of Philip Sherman's dentist office. You might think this is an abject impossibility. It's fictional. Well, luckily for us, Sydney is not. And nor is the very intentional detail Pixar claims to put in their films. These claims are entirely true. Their films are some of the most accurate pieces of work I've ever seen, aside from some little things I'll mention in a minute. Pixar very accurately portrays the famous Sydney Harbour. They have the Sydney Tower, the Opera House, and the enormous bridge. They have ferries seen going into the terminal. So accurate. So using the sheer angle of which the window looks out to these three primary structures, we can pinpoint the geographical coordinates in which Sherman practices dentistry. You may have seen the online viral images of a Sydney dentist that is named P. Sherman. BuzzFeed, being the equally elaborate people they often are, actually went out there looking back in 2015 and confirmed that this is a location you cannot go to. A fake, presumably. Now here I was, hoping I could identify the location truthfully through the reflection on the road of the door glass, but despite my clear madness, I'm not the kind of person to waste time. Mm -hmm. Sort of. But what BuzzFeed did was they just went and found a random dentist in Sydney. They never even gave the direct address, but after I pinpointed the exact location they took this picture from the phone numbers on the building's window, I realized that they too fraudulently claimed this like they often do. Simply turning around to the other side of the street will show that there is no water directly there, which was the essential crux of Gil's Mission Impossible plan to escape. No, you need exact viewpoints to find this place, which we get in film one. Now, I'm physically lazier than the colossal corporation of BuzzFeed, but I've never set foot in Sydney, so Australians correct me if I'm wrong, but Google Maps is my friend today. And thank God for their needlessly elaborate plan to photograph every street on the planet. Hold up. How can I of all people complain about something being needlessly elaborate? like that, I guess. Anyways, the first thing you'll notice is that the Opera House, Tower, and Bridge form a rather clean patterned line if you look at them from very specific angles. This unique alignment and order of infrastructure along with the ferry directions can only be seen from one general spot where there happen to be a plethora of peninsulas poking out from the area. Only one of them is at the range where you could get any shot remotely like this, however. Philip Sherman is on the second floor of a building which faces a street into the ocean. These peninsulas have this feature, but one best encapsulates it. This one here, Robertson's Point. Look at this view. And so like that, we have the generally intended location of the office. It's near perfect. The only issue is some areas of the scaling, but that's just one of those aforementioned minor detail issues. There are more, and I'll explain them after I very quickly also pinpoint the location of the Marine Life Institute from Finding Dory. Okay, I'll go fast. We need to get into the main evidence. This one's a piece of cake. They just call it the Jewel of Morro Bay, which is a real Californian location, Morro Bay. But when Dory hijacks the Cleveland transport truck, they drive past several real street signs, calling out such places as Gilman Street. This and several other streets called out here are actually spots in Berkeley, California that all connect. I even saw a San Pablo Avenue Avenue, which I think I remember from The Incredibles. All this proves is that Pixar can be messy with their details. They want you to solve things, they've been open about it, but the problem with anything ever like this is people not knowing what is analyzable or intended and what is not. These streets are Easter eggs. Morro Bay is not in Berkeley. The whole theme of California in this film gives off the feel of San Francisco, which just makes me want to tie in Toy Story inside out and up again, but as I said, we'll stick here for now. It's easy to pinpoint just Morro Bay. That's it. But I'm detailing all of this because we're about to head into territory where these confusions become problematic. If you remember my videos on Megamind, I ended up ripping the plot holes so far that the logic became unrealistic. This is a problem for me, and I almost did it with this upcoming, because Pixar could either be pulling the most elaborate story in history, 
or they could be selectively lazy. Because this crucial detail either proves the year Finding Nemo takes place, or it does something far worse. As you'll remember from the last video, I said the only video I really watched while doing my analysis was the one by fellow theory channel Super Carlin Brothers. They noticed the calendar on Philip's wall. Using the fact that it says November, and where the dates land on the week, it is concluded that Finding Nemo takes place in either 2009 or 1998. No other understandable time is available in this period. This is quite true, and by this extension, Finding Dory would take place anywhere from November 1999 to November 2010, although it looks summery in this film. The one year later can mean multiple things, I suppose. Then again, it's California. The problem is just in the fact that while many things are blurry on this calendar, a few key things are seen, like the day he went diving for Nemo, or the day of Darla's birthday, which is on a very hilariously creepy Friday the 13th. But here's where I begin to wonder, is this intentional? They had the will to label out this calendar with stuff I can barely read, and yet they seem to think November has 31 days. And here's where things collapse into a pile of dust. Either Pixar has intentionally put 31 days in November, or they've just decided to label 31 days on a calendar that they, for the sake of ease, started on the first square, which happens to be, of course, Sunday. This problem happens again with the Sunday on a first. It happens in Finding Dory. I scanned this office room and bam, there it is. We don't know the month, but going back, 1999 had Sunday on the 1st in August, and 2010 did as well. August in those months has 31 days, one year later, summer, mm. But you see the problem here? Either this clear intention of animating November is a lie, and November is not the month Finding Nemo takes place, or Philip Sherman is terrible at making calendars. Because it does seem as though this calendar doubles as a dry erase board, he can change what it shows. Now, because we never see the month on the calendar in Finding Dory, and I simply couldn't analyze any more in looking through the movie for it, we don't know if it's accurate. But if this Sherman Dentists and Pianists group make these calendars as well as the posters, we could have an error consistency that's intentional. No, in all honesty, Pixar's errors like this are minor and could be explained away as Philip Sherman being too lazy to even erase the dry erase part of November he had put up there. But the key here is that Finding Nemo began production around 1998, the main possible year for Sunday, November 1st. I mean, things like the clocks on the wall are even accurate for their times and appointment lengths and such. So basically, as confusing as this is, Pixar is either making errors or Philip Sherman himself is. But unfortunately for all of this, another thing, bombshells are precious tea party of calendar dates. Philip Sherman's Electronic Aquarium Filter. Finding Nemo is a film that was released in 2003. The Aquascum 2003 seems almost as if it was intended to be named that to correspond with the planned release in 2003. And you could say that it's just a joking phrase like the Blabomatic 3000 or something, or even that it's just an easter egg and not valid data. But then you might realize that it literally says copyright 2003 inside of a pamphlet book, consciously animated, and it's not like Philip is going to have a six-year-old new technology if this film takes place in 2009. So then, does it take place in 2003? It would seem that it's as simple as this. Philip Sherman is such a bustling dentist that he cares not about changing the month on his calendar, in which case 2003 had a Sunday, June 1st. June, a summer month fit for this kind of weather. Then again, it's Sydney. <sighs> In the midst of all of this, though, we do have one single confirmed stable data point. Darla is turning eight years old during the movie. In Australia, as Australians will know, the school year ends around December and picks up again late January. If you also remember, we have translated that the guidebook claimed she was in second grade. This makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. If she were American, it would mean we could pinpoint the month range of her birthday, but this is just more confirmation that she isn't American. The photo seen throughout most of the film was from one year ago, marking her seventh birthday. If you look in the image's background, the photo was taken in the same dentist's office. Yet again, I'll claim that she does do this Philip Sherman visit annually. In one shot, Philip Sherman walked up to a small boy patient and said, Little Davy Reynolds. 
Davey Reynolds is a famous 33-year-old racing driver who would have been this exact age in 1998. Oh, and also, he's Australian. However, a screenwriter who worked on this film is also named... Davey Reynolds. And Pixar has an obsession with naming streets and characters after real things. This is a copious problem for me, and I hope you can see the impossibility in identifying this last key detail. Best I can understand is that it does take place in some time around 1998 to 2003, the film's production. But all of these final and huge details are leading to an end purpose. You see, these details all caught other things in my eye when viewing them. The big picture. Sure, Darla's photo is seen in the Marine Life Institute, but we also get to see the very two people who work in that office. I think the Sherman family studies fish intelligence, and I think the incredibly, incredibly bizarre, hyper-meta in-universe character of Sigourney Weaver, voiced by none other than the real Sigourney Weaver, is a key in this all. I would say she's Darla's mother if I didn't already claim her to be Australian. We see more people in Philip's office, and I'm going to genetically peg all of them. And you can feel it, but unfortunately, you're right. This is all going to have to be pushed into next week or the week after. Obviously, though, for the final time. I'm literally theorizing on part three as I write this video, and people on my Twitter knew this was going to happen. This three-parter was supposed to be collectively an hour long in the end. Let's see if I'm able to compress it enough, because it needs that. Sherman's receptionist Barbara is a key player in all of this too. The humans of Finding Nemo have a mass conspiracy going on, and I'm gonna solve it. P. Sherman is a pun on fishermen. Darla's Australian. Philip Sherman is a naturalist in a family of dentists. Five generations of dental work, 1895. Intelligent marine life, pianist parents, spying toys, Sigourney Weaver, world's best dad, triple timeline, daddy Sherman, matching genetics, receptionist Barbara, 9 a.m. P. Sherman, 42 Wallaby Way, Sydney, triangulation, inheritance, blue divers, prime ministers, divorce, piranhas! <gasps> this complexity, this borderline conspiratorial level of animated detail, I conclude it all today as I lay out the family tree of Darla Sherman and the timeline of her family. All massive information hidden between the lines of Binding Me. Hello. I'm the Theorizer, and finally I'm finishing this awesome series of videos. This is easily the best one. Everything up until this point has just been fiddling with little evidence. This is the theory. It's an awesome series of videos. It's only three videos, this being of course the third and final, but of course if you haven't seen the first two thirds of this mega theory, I will now link them in the white box in the top right corner. I hope you're all ready for the awesomeness because here it comes. All of the many details I've scoured so far can fit perfectly in one way, which I suppose is best displayed in a timeline format. I do love me some timelines, but before that, I'll recap the main details of Darla Sherman and her parents. We know that Darla's uncle, Philip Sherman, must be related to her through a male due to the last name. This means Philip Sherman has a brother who is Darla's father. Darla herself is now confirmed to indeed be Australian, as opposed to speculatively American. You see, because her recurrent photograph is seen in the Californian Marine Life Institute of Finding Dory, it makes you think that maybe one of her parents lives in America. And one of them does. She doesn't, though, despite it being implied that she only sees her uncle for a little while once a year. This is because her parents are very clearly not together anymore. She has clear obsessions and fascinations with things that she associates with people, but this fish addiction is not just because of Phil Sherman, but rather her father, who lives in California and works at the Marine Life Institute. Makes sense. She spends most of her time with her mom, who also lives in Sydney. Darla's aggression is not an uncommon thing to see in children of divorce, and almost implies that something really terrible happened with her father and mother. Darla's main orthodontist is Philip Sherman, given the fact that she receives a braces discount, but Phil's relations with her father makes her mother weary of too many visits. Her father likely visits her annually, time which she spends with that whole side of the family. 
Philip has a deep passion for diving and being a naturalist. It even surpasses his love of dentistry. In Finding Nemo, which takes place sometime around 2003, long, long story, Dr. Sherman mans his boat, the Aussie Flosser, to go out and find some fish. He kidnaps Nemo, thinking he's saving him. There is a mysterious additional man diving with him in identical but blue scuba gear. In the now infamous Essential Guidebook, it states that Dr. Sherman most often loves diving with his peers from dental school, but given the timing with Darla and the tourist-type way this man photographs the drop-off, I'm inclined to say that this is possibly his brother, Darla's dad, out with Dr. Sherman, looking for a fish to immortalize himself into Darla's memory yet again. They tried it exactly one year prior with Chuckles the Goldfish. Darla's father desperately wants to keep ties to her and continuously buys her fish as a symbol of his occupation and passion. Her sheer excitement whenever she gets a fish, it symbolizes the family member who's never around. She's found a love of piranhas. All of this focus on fish. These two desperate men go so far as to photograph her in the office with a dead goldfish just in an attempt to get some memory from her visit. Dr. Sherman keeps the photo alongside Daddy Sherman, who puts it up in his quarantine office at the Jewel of Morro Bay. Philip Sherman, mysteriously enough, is also a famous dentist working on the teeth of celebrities and such people as the Prime Minister of Australia. We literally see this in film. Now, I'm actually inclined to agree with the theory that the Super Carlin brothers posed regarding how her shirt could imply a famous musician family member. But like all things in Finding Nemo, the guidebook inverts the truth. And it's simply this. The guidebook openly says that Philip Sherman got Darla this shirt, which makes sense, given how oversized it is for her. He rarely sees her and barely knows her size, but I'm not calling her father an ex-guitarist or something, no. He was a pianist. Or at least, that's the only thing I could think of to tie the otherwise very random detail of Sherman's dental posters, which say they were made by pianists and dentists of Sydney. Naturalistic posters encouraging dental hygiene, with a random piano reference thrown in there? It's got to mean something, even if it's just a nonsensical easter egg thrown in the face of logic. It's all tying into how Darla's mother is so alienated from her father. So what kind of treachery could instill such feelings of clear hostility, resulting in a violent child? Adultery? Fame does things to people, but adultery is always a default cliché in these cases. There's minimal proof for it, but we see multiple people in Finding Nemo and Finding Dory who could be candidates for cheating, believe it or not. In a second, though, I'll get to that. Because something much more intense, something that comes seemingly out of left field, happens. The events of Finding Nemo lead Philip Sherman to, no joke, move to California. I know. He possibly even moved with his wife Barbara, but only if she's his wife, more on that later. He's there to study fish with his brother after learning that the fish in his dental office were intelligent enough to attack him and escape. Holy shit! where did I pull this from? Let me explain, because I think the animals in Finding Dory specifically are being studied for their intelligence. The very famous Pixar theory mega timeline delves into this a little bit. There are sections dedicated to how AI, humans, and intelligent animals all converge in the future, but make no mistake. This similar conclusion is only something I am coming to for Finding Nemo, based on evidence only from Finding Nemo. Because it's so true, and there seriously is no other explanation for the fresh mind blow I'm about to deliver. The animals in the Finding Nemo films are particularly intelligent creatures who can communicate with more than just voices and assimilate far beyond mere instinct. They are mutated and evolving. Darla's dad studies the increasing intelligence of marine life. An excellent example is Hank the Octopus, who can literally camouflage, act bizarrely humanoid, and once again, like all fish, has high, high intelligence. He's notorious at the Institute for being clever and outwitting the staff. These animals are smart, and this fish hospital takes advantage of disabled marine life to study it. A good example for just how bizarre this movie series truly is, is how the fish speak to each other. Not only can they do it underwater, where sound travels terribly, but they can do it from literal bags away. 
Nemo can hear his dad scream from Nigel's beak as he's in a bag on the counter. He communicates with the tank gang through the same bag, and the tank gang's own members communicate with each other through the plastic bags after escaping. Even Peach, the starfish, has a bit of intrigue when she speaks while stuck to the side of the aquarium glass. The fish say they can't hear her when she's stuck, and then she flips back and says, we've got a live one, before, no joke, flipping right back onto the glass and talking. Now they can hear her fine? Yes, because they just got closer to her. She's flipped back the same way. See, it's because their form of communication is more sophisticated than simple sound waves traveling through water. And the Marine Life Institute is aware that some animals are developing this, albeit ones that can assimilate. Not ones like the anglerfish on the bottom of the sea, or ones like the brainless jellyfish, or ones like Becky, the mentally disabled bird. It's why the Marine Life Institute isn't really all that shocked when the fish do crazy things. It's brilliant. And the reason I know P. Sherman did move to Morro Bay is because he was supposed to make an appearance in Finding Dory. Now, I'm not sure exactly where this information comes from, but given the fact that it's riddled across multiple wikis and the fact that, remember, Pixar confirmed P. Sherman is the man shearing sheep from Boundin, and it takes place in Western America, bang. Even if it's just his model, that's still unique enough for them to mention, and each piece of trivia proves the other. The trivia of his planned Finding Dory voice role was likely from a bonus commentary. Even disregarding all of this cyclical evidence, we know the obvious facts of Darla's photo being there, and lots of Californian brochures being on P. Sherman's office wall. P. Sherman lives in California now. I'm not even sure, but I think I saw his Aussie Flosser boat being hauled on a freeway in Finding Dory. He's a naturalist. He works in tandem with his family to prove the intelligence of animals, and it was a speaking role. He was important enough to be here. It was cut because the voice actor passed away in 2011, however. So animals are smart. This should come as no surprise to anybody, honestly. Even fish who rarely see the outside world, like Marlin, know all about the things humans do. He knows what balloons are, but not dentists. It's interesting. I'm even prompted to think that the person who touched Hank and traumatized him by supposedly ripping off one of his arms was a Sherman. It would be the kind of thing for Pixar to do, but there's literally zero evidence for that, and Occam's razor shreds it to bits. Darla's got a love of fish, she obsesses with trivia on piranhas, and this is a hell of a lot of speculation, but it's all tied down properly. My final piece of speculation before I throw a family tree in here is that Barbara, Philip's receptionist, is his wife. She knows Darla well, she calls Philip love, she's the appropriate age, and there's nothing totally crucial here, but we can put her as his wife for now, just to fill the slot on the family tree. So here it is. Darla is the daughter of an occupational MLI naturalist with a hobby for pianos, and her mother is a Sydney woman who had a very vicious breakup with her husband. Maybe their alienation was built over time as he lived in California, or maybe he cheated, I don't know, but the aggression was so great that it caused Darla to become an animal killer. Daddy Sherman has a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, and a great-great-grandfather, who all practiced dentistry at 42 Wallaby Way, Sydney, and their title was passed on to Philip, Darla's uncle. We can assume Philip is the older sibling for reasons such as the title being passed to him, among other little observational features. Philip is an occupational dentist with a hobby for naturalism who shifts his practice to California after the events of Finding Nemo. He could be married to a Sydney woman named Barbara. Wham! That's the tree. Before the timeline, though, there are three more small things that we need to establish. The MLI seafloor, the owners of the quarantine office, and genetics. First, the Marine Life Institute has some interesting things lurking beneath the surface of its surrounding waters. There are a few Easter eggs, but most prominently, there are a couple of cars. What could this mean? What kind of person drives cars into the ocean next to an aquarium? Oh. My. God. Dory's fish escape has happened before. Fish have escaped from here more than once. It's the only thing that makes sense. It's why this hospitable aquarium doubles as a study center. They are used to this sort of madness. It's why they're aware of fish intelligence in the first place. This is a huge detail, but there isn't much more I can really say about it, other than that it supports my theory. Another thing we see on the seafloor in a few places is a best dad ever mug. 
It could be nothing, but in my opinion, it's a reference to the idea that a father works here. Obviously, the chances of that are very likely, but given our newfound knowledge that Pixar has hidden this very specific story in their films, could it be a rather direct reference to Darla's father? I'm not sure, but the seafloor is clearly important. Second on the list is the Quarantine Office, the specific one that contains Darla's photograph. This is probably the most revealingly intriguing point of these three mini topics because believe it or not, we see the people who put Dory into this office, the ones that captured her. Now, whether or not they're the ones who own the office, well, I cannot be sure, but they linger on the mail of this duo for quite some time as he makes a joke. He is then scolded by the female. In the background of this office, we can also see an automotive coupon, a map of the oceans, a picture of a glacier, and a similar looking tropical ad to the one Dr. Sherman had. The twosome that enter the office, at first I thought she called him Phil, which would have put another rapid spin on things, but not only did she, well, not call him Phil, but the people who put Dory in this room aren't the ones healing her. This is quarantine, and a more technical sort of chemist would be the one to work in this spot, as seen with the beakers. The woman here does clarify that the man is a scientist, but everyone working here is technically. So we need someone with a similar build to Dr. Sherman, who looks like the diver, and who works in quarantine. When Hank scuttles around the corner, a man in another office picks up the phone and says, Hi, how are you? to some mysterious other person in the building. This is the office in which we see that pesky calendar, which is etched with permanent dates. You know, it's not like the one that Dr. Sherman could mess up with dry erase, although it's got the same format. The interesting thing, however, is that the month finding Dory takes place can actually be pinpointed a bit better by looking at how much of the calendar is flipped so far. It's not January, February, or any time after June, and it's a month that can have 31 days, so it's another Sunday the 1st. This leaves March 2009, May 2005, and March 1998. What am I doing? Sorry. That's what part two was for. It's just, again, the dates are confusing. <laughs> What's most important here is the man in the room. He doesn't look to be old enough to be Dr. Sherman's brother. He's much younger. He's looking for Hank the Octopus like the rest of the MLI. Point is, while either he, the male from the duo, or some other scientist could be Darla's dad, there's evidence all around of this father having a new partner the female in the duo, for example. We see both of the men again, loading the Cleveland truck in quarantine. I do not know, but it's one of these workers in this building. The picture proves that it absolutely, positively has to be. You'd think that he'd have an Australian accent, but we don't get to hear all of the people speak and the accents can be fickle anyways, so moving on to the final topic here, genetics. Darla has incredibly distinct green eyes and red hair, which are extremely recessive genes, making it highly likely that one of her parents has these features. Philip Sherman does not seem to have these features. He has blue eyes and brown hair, as seen in previous photos before it began to gray. We see a bald man in Sherman's waiting room, right age, with greenish eyes, and because it could be either parent who has those recessive genes, this could in fact be her dad, who parked his car after quickly dropping off Darla. I honestly don't know, the criteria is specific, but the list of candidates is immense, and this video is getting downright frighteningly long, so I'll wrap it up. If I were to flatten this whole entire series of events out into a timeline, I'd probably make it double-sided, one for the events of California and one for the events of Sydney. It begins with the creation of 42 Wallaby Way as a dentist's office in 1895 and Sherman I owning it. It is passed down to Sherman II. It is then passed down to Sherman III. Finally, it is passed on to Sherman IV. It is a famous dentist business at this point, working on celebrities and the Prime Minister. Ads all throughout the newspaper. Sherman IV is the father of the two brothers I have been calling Philip and the Darla Daddy. Philip's duty is to maintain this tradition, and he honestly doesn't mind doing dental work. He goes to university and loves it, gets a ton of certificates, joins academies, and even wins tons of awards in his younger years. He has dedicated his life to dentistry, but his true hobby revolves around nature, and all of this leaves him no time to have children of his own, but he might be married to a woman named Barbara, his receptionist. 
It's very apparent that he has no children, given his behavior towards Darla. He's around 50 to 60, given his appearance. Meanwhile, younger sibling Daddy Darla doesn't inherit the dentistry business and pursues a similar passion to his brother, that of marine life and nature. His additional passion is music, or at least as far as those little hints on Darla's shirt and the possible piano link on the poster is concerned. He might have had a few music businesses based on these clues and the shirt and poster Philip buys, but after a vicious breakup with his wife from alienation, cheating, or some other nasty thing, he leaves. He even had a daughter with this woman, and he's forced to leave her too. This takes a toll on Darla's aggression, and she develops an obsessive fascination with her father's hobby, fish. Part of the guidebook I could not translate mentioned how Darla feels like she needs a fish, and if it doesn't appear as though it likes her, she'll snap. That's as much as I could sort of make out from the blur. Her father has studied animals for some time though, and has learnt of their uniquely evolving properties. He moves to California so he can work at a center for studying fish, he keeps his daughter in his mind at all times, keeps a photo of her in his lab, and visits her once a year. Philip is still Darla's orthodontist, but aside from that, Dr. Sherman only spends large amounts of time with her when her father is around. The mother is quite vindictive, you see. On Darla's seventh birthday, she is given a goldfish named Chuckle who she kills by shaking its bag. The Sherman brothers take a photo of her and keep it, despite its abjectly macabre nature. Two copies, seen in two places. As Dr. Sherman says, exactly one year later, on her eighth birthday, Finding Nemo takes place. Darla's daddy and Dr. Sherman go out and find her a fish. She spends a week with her dad before visiting her uncle. Madness ensues. She is traumatized by the events that occur during her visit with her uncle. After all this goes down, Philip acknowledges the brilliance of his animals. The remainder of his tank fish escape through the window after breaking his 2003 device, and he's had it. He gives it all up to be with his brother, he becomes a naturalist, fulfilling his lifelong passion. We get confirmation of this in Finding Dory's pre-production, and in the short film Boundin, which shows him tending to the land nature as well. He does all of this because fish have been acting out. They've been getting smarter and escaping places like the Institute. Sherman is intrigued, and he joins the study. Then, one year after the events of Finding Nemo, Finding Dory occurs. Dory's hijacking of the truck is the final straw for this fishy institute, and, along with Hank the Octopus's elusive nature, animal intelligence has been leaked to the world. So what happens after Finding Dory? Well, now I have to finally go into the territory I didn't want to, but I'm honestly left with no choice. Remember how I said Easter eggs don't count? It's true. Ones like the impossible to take picture of Darla do not count. But ones like, I sh you not, Riley from Inside Out visiting the Jewel of Morro Bay do count because <sighs> Finding Nemo is the hidden fourth series that takes place in the Emma Jean Pixar universe. For those who don't know, I've been constructing a major theory since 2016 that proves how not all Pixar films are connected, but the Toy Story films, Inside Out and Up, most certainly are, because of a woman named Emma Jean. The very famous Pixar theory is all about Easter eggs. This is about facts that tie the movies together, identical locations, confirmed by the directors, and it's all because of this woman named Emma Jean. And this Finding Nemo theory trilogy I've made is nothing more than a backdoor sequel to that series of videos. You should watch them, or rather only part one, which I will link in the white box above now, because it all ties in. We see Riley there, in the Institute, visiting. I've even pondered Ratatouille fitting into this mini-verse as well because of Renata. If you want to know what I mean there, consult my trilogy of theories on Gusto, which I won't link because I'm running out of space and time here. Darla's cameo in Toy Story is physically impossible, but they do take place in the same universe. Riley, who lives in the close-by city of San Francisco, confirms it, absolutely. Did you know that Sigourney Weaver also voices a robot from Wally? -E? Almost like it's an AI announcer in Finding Dory 2? Nah, that's too ultimate timeline-ish for me. But when you do a deep dive like this into the actual evidence minus surface level speculation, the famous Pixar theory, believe it or not, gets inverted, just like everything else. And it's amazing, but I refuse to share it all. It would take too many videos. 
but I won't hide it for long. So many connections, even in just this Finding Nemo duology. The scuba diver in Sherman's tank could be spying on the fish's IQ, or Emma Jean's wishing you were here line could be referencing Australia. All of the Pixar films that take place between 1900 and the present, minus maybe The Incredibles, can be tied together. I'm not saying this is the Pixar theory, this is far different. Renata from Ratatouille and Darla's father are connected. Orange hair like Linguini. Oh. My. shit. <gasps> Emma Jean is Renata Linguini and Darla's mother. Theory channels, don't you dare steal my flow here. I'm making a Ratatouille theory as we speak. And until next time, I'm the theorizer. Subscribe immediately. This is far from over. I have never in my life been so excited for theorizing here. My upload schedule is utterly packed. And you should click the bell too to join this madness while it lasts because this just got amazing. I'm here to analyze it deeper next time, but there's already a basis I just posed. Okay, outro time. Wow, okay. I don't even know where to begin with this video. Um, this is the video I've been building to since my channel began. A theory so complete, speculation so absurd, ideas so integral. If my recent theories on Pixar films have been any example, you'll see that I'm correct when I say brainstorming spawns truth. The only video you probably have to watch before this one would be my very first Pixar multiverse theory. It's only 10 or 15 minutes long, I'll link it in the top right corner box now. The rest I think I can summarize for a few minutes here. All right, so in 2015, I began by speculating on how Remy from the film Ratatouille controls Linguini with his hair. It was a very short and pathetic video, but it began to come to some lore conclusions. I started 2016 by building a massive timeline of hidden events by piecing together the lives of characters such as Anton Ego and Chef Gusteau, deeply tying them together through the old woman at the beginning of the film. Later that year, I used the unifying factor of a mystery woman known as Emma Jean to directly prove how at least Up, Toy Story, and Inside Out all took place in the same universe, and a fractured family tree is split across those films. I also redid my Ratatouille timeline here. In 2017, I began brainstorming ideas on both these theories, and in 2018, I solved everything for Ratatouille and unsolved the mystery of Andy's dad from Toy Story. So as you can see, we've been developing this multiverse theory for quite some time. And finally, earlier this very year, I made my longest theory ever by a long shot, dissecting Darla and P. Sherman's family from Finding Nemo, inverting the famous Pixar theory, and managing to, in a stunning turn of events, tie it and Ratatouille both to the Emma Jean theories. Now, I've made theories on many other Pixar films, but either they aren't relevant here, or they don't have any proof of existing in this little Pixar universe but these five movies. The speculative mind blow you're about to receive, I have never, in the over three and a half years I've been theorizing, been so unequivocally excited, so absolutely hyped, and so hyperactively shook. To bring you what you're about to see, I myself didn't even know it was coming until my aha moment upon writing the Finding Nemo Theory trilogy, and if you aren't open to this sort of thing, brainstorming between the lines of Pixar films, that's fine. You can say, oh, they're just movies, but if you're into this kind of thing, like Pixar Studios themselves is, hiding easter eggs across their movies and revealing them, then the treat you're about to receive is something I don't even know how to explain fully. And now that we're all caught up, I'm so excited to finally do this. Hello, I'm the Theorizer, and that little pre-intro monologue was necessarily atrociously long, but I can't stall anymore. Here's what I've discovered about these five films, and their directly pentagonal connections. So first of all, I call it the Californian Quintet, because Toy Story is implied to take place in California, within a location more specifically known as the Tri-County area. Inside Out mostly takes place in San Francisco, and Up takes place 
wherever it does, but it's all directly tied in with these two other movies. But upon tying in Moro Bay and Renata's American backstory during the Finding Nemo theories from weeks ago, that also brings Finding Nemo and Ratatouille into the mix here, making it five Pixar franchises at least that take place in this mini-universe within California. Films like WALL-E and The Incredibles have their own timeline, but I've noticed that the focus of this little timeline seems to be smart animals that think and talk as well as humans can. And who knows, maybe Monsters Inc.'s doors are breaching space-time and poking not back in time, like the famous Pixar theory states, but rather into a whole different branch of the Pixar multiverse. This one. Which of course makes sense then, given the appearance of Boo's room and the easter eggs found throughout. Anyways, Finding Nemo has astronomical amounts of proof stating that both it, Finding Dory, and the Incredibles short film Boundin all take place in this miniverse. But Ratatouille is, for now, based only in assumption from the concepts of animal intelligence and Renata moving to the US. But that problem is what I'm solving here. I mean, I can't just leave that gobsmacking ending to my Finding Nemo Theory trilogy just sitting there forever, so let's now go into that. Riley Anderson is seen in the Marine Life Institute of Finding Dory on a class field trip to Morro Bay, coming from San Francisco. Its placement in this universe is quite clear, obvious, easy, but Ratatouille, all we know from my fervent theorizing is that Linguini's mother moved from Paris to America after getting pregnant because of Gusteau. She eventually moved back and died there, but Renata Linguini isn't the only mystery redhead in this pentology of films. There are two more, who come frighteningly close to fitting Renata's description. For those still somehow unaware, Emma Jean is a mystery woman who was Carl Fredrickson's previous love interest in the film Up. This was openly confirmed by the directors. Now, she was never actually seen in the movie, but her name was seen as the sender of a letter to Carl and Ellie, which is on Andy Davis's wall from Toy Story 3. Emma was Carl's love interest at a time right before he married his childhood best friend Ellie, and though Emma Jean divorced Carl, they all remained very good friends. Again, this was literally all revealed by the actual director, Pete Docter, in an interview with the Carlin brothers. It's mind-blowing, really, but this all leaves basically one huge question. Who is Emma Jean in the movies? Do we see anyone who actually fits her criteria? I keep looking back to Carl and Nellie's wedding because the couple in the first row appears to be the perfect age, the perfect excitement level, the perfect everything. But we need to test the genetics before it can ever truly become on my radar. So let's finally go deeper. If Emma Jean is best friends with Carl and Ellie, then she's bound to be at their wedding. There's no shred of doubt based on what we know about their relationships. What we need to do is eliminate the people seen here. Emma Jean's significance in being a red herring in Toy Story 3 is integral and means she'd be here at the wedding, in the very least, given her massive friendship with the Fredericksons. The likelihood that she is near the front and with the eccentric people is also high given her elusiveness but importance everywhere else. So with this knowledge intact, we move on to the third and final mystery woman, established a few weeks ago in my Finding Nemo Theory trilogy, Darla's mother. Darla has red hair, and we established that it was more likely that her mother, over father, had red hair, given Philip Sherman's genetics. He and Darla's dad show none of her genes. If there's one key thing that's notable in all of this, it's that there is one major consistency that can be seen. Miraculously, Renata and Mommy Darla both have red hair. Linguini's mother is all but visually confirmed to follow this trait, given Linguini's strikingly rare genetic makeup, which is nothing like Gusto's. Darla is the same, and Emma Jean could also have this trait, judging from the average hair color of the people at the wedding. So are they all the same person? I jokingly exaggerated this at the end of the Nemo theories, but while I don't think think that's the case, I do think this consistency could mean something more. I believe that we can pin down the years all of these franchises take place by using one key detail, the fact that all three women are the Linguini sisters. Speculation territory, unevidential hypothesis. Warning, if you are a hyper-realistic person that is out to debunk my theories, look away. This is the part where I brainstorm like mad. 
Additionally, I'm saying it here so you don't need to comment that it's ridiculous as clarification. Oh, but you will. You will. <laughs> I've said it before and I'll say it again. Brainstorming like this has led to such revelations as the entire Finding Nemo Theory trilogy, so brace yourself for what's to come. This will not be factual, but I'm about to state a bunch of things I can work off of. Oh boy. Due to this whole recap and now finding and tying evidence together, I'm gonna have to throw up all my ideas right now and sort them out over the course of like a week. Ah, uh, Pixar, why do you do this? Emma remarried and is a gene. This is key. We don't know her true last name. Wishing you were here in Australia, like Darla's mother, whose appearance we only deduced based off of what is implied. She is Australian now, but perhaps not always. It's possible she moved there after meeting Darla's father when he traveled to America to work at the Institute, assuming he did that for a while pre-Nemo. Finally, we're not a Linguini. Only the last name, but she's the second confirmed mystery mom who has the orange hair rarity of Pixar films. The only other one that exists for certain is Ellie, or at least as a non-dyed child. Shockingly enough, many have considered Ellie to be the sibling to Emma Jean prior to the reveals. This has been discussed before, but never ever in the history of existence in this context. If she is related to Emma, then that gives evidence to the notion that Emma too is a redhead, confirming all of this if we could establish a familial relationship. But that final question posed two and a half years ago by myself must be answered first. Who is Emma Jean married to now? In this video so far, we've taken the much needed time to recap all I've done. And then we established the main theory proving who the three sisters could be, if they're sisters at all, brainstorm style. But the proof is there for something multiverse related. Next time I'll solve Emma's new love interest amongst the rest I just posed and create a final family tree. This was just getting everything back into the groove, back into the loop, putting out all the evidence, all the speculation, all the brainstorming. I will spend an entire week trying to solve this if if there is any possible way to do that everything loops back this guy gary jerry whatever his name is relates to emma jean who relates to andy who gave him the toy who fixed the toy <gasps> but emma's last name is jean now but how does eye color change jerry's identity how does riley have a smartphone in nemo's 2004 universe Ratatouille's short film star is Linguini's brother. Chess piece is all. Only other old guy in Pixar at this timeline coordinate. Too much. As you can see, I need the time to regroup and organize now that everything's out on the table. Hello. I'm the Theorizer. Let us do this. No stalling, no confusion, pure organization. You'll know everything if you simply watch the first half of this analysis. I had to split the theory in two videos because it became way too complex to cram into one, so I'll link part one in the box in the top right corner of the screen now. Get it? Got it? Good. So, this requires lots of infographics and organizable animations. We have Emma Linguini Jean, Mrs. Linguini Sherman, and Renata Linguini Gusto. The red-headed female Linguini triplets spread across the world map, reaching France, Australia, and all across America, spanning Finding Nemo, Ratatouille, Up, Inside Out, and Toy Story all contained to a single universal prong of the greater Pixar multiverse. In this universe, animals are the focus, their intelligence and interrelations with humanity. More could tie in, but later, because for now, we have a small list of questions required to solve, allowing us to evidentially flatten out the logic before we make the tree. First, we solve the most key of all key questions. Did Jerry Jean marry Emma Linguini? Gary or Jerry, I have no idea how to pronounce that. I'll just rotate back and forth throughout the video. Is a man from Pixar's short film, Jerry's Game. The short film involves him, an old man, playing chess in a park. He walks to the other side of the board and pretends to be a snarky opponent playing chess against his cleverly meek self with glasses. 
that's all. And he's one of the only main character old people in the Pixar universe. It seems rather obvious at first that he could be a potential candidate for any man Emma Jean remarried, but don't let the short film convince you of something's canonicity. Instead, look no further than in Toy Story 2, where we see him yet again. He is a toy fixer, a cleaner, and he fixes up Woody for the collector. Lo and behold, amongst his tools we see a chess piece, referencing the short film. It's the exact same man, aside from a minor change in glasses, and unfortunately the big one, eye color. I do believe Pixar has done this to throw us off the scent, despite everything else being identical, including the chess piece. The hair is slightly different too, but Pixar chose to change the eye color, so what evidence trumps the other? A slight change in eye color? Or a full-blown chess piece as reference? I don't know, maybe they're twins. Maybe Gary's game is about him pretending to be his twin who died and he cannot cope. Okay, hold on. That's left field and nuts. No, I think that, if anything, it's the toy cleaner who's more tied into all of this. So let's just call this guy Gary or Jerry or whatever, the updated model. This guy in Toy Story 2 who has more story. We know he cleans toys, clearly does play chess, but has very distinct, genetically characteristic, bright blue eyes like many other characters in my tree here. It's the prime consistency. It's almost like Pixar intentionally gave him blue eyes to fit him in here. It truly is peculiar. It's like they're doing it to benefit this lore, not debunk it. Now that we've got a basis for our brainstormed tree, we have to prove it. Most of this is exclusively based on patterns like timing, locations, genetics, and last names. And we have to confirm all of those promptly. First, we'll do the genetics. You can see first off that Linguini has a huge nose like Gary, but primarily, Pixar tends to factor in hair color and eye color when they want to denote a genetic consistency, as we've seen. So let's check. We already know that the individual family tree of the Fredericksons, the Shermans, and the Gusteau family are accurate, but here's the grand family tree I'm proposing. Since I've had a whole week to mull it over, I've realized that timing is not completely in favor of this idea of the Linguini triplets, which means Emma Jean is more likely to be of a higher generation like Gary, Carl, and Ellie. The connection points we have added involve that of Mrs. Sherman and Renata Linguini, which means in order to prove much of anything, we need to tie them to Derry's final model form. So we know Darla has green eyes and Linguini has brown eyes. Since Gusto has greenish blue eyes, that means Renata must have brown eyes. Darla has greenish blue eyes and her uncle and likely her father have blue eyes. This means her mother must have a slightly more dominant trait like green or brown. None of this is consistent with Gary's new model, which has blue eyes. It is, however, indicative of Emma Jean having dark eyes, which is interesting because if you remember the one single genetic abnormality of the original family tree, it was that Jill Anderson has brown eyes. Given Riley's blue eyes and blonde hair, we stated that it must be a fact that she had a previous ancestor with blue eyes, since her father is also brown all the way. You might say that that's looking more and more like Emma Jean, but the only way for Renata and Mrs. Sherman to possibly have the eyes they do is if Emma has brown eyes and red hair. So if Jerry has blue eyes now and Emma must have dark eyes, then Riley's blue eyes almost certainly come from Carl Fredrickson. It is solved. So the three mystery women, they all have red hair and brown or green eyes. They're probably freckled too if Darla Sherman and Alfredo Linguini are of any indication. The blue-eyed consistency on the Carl side of Emma's family tree is restricted to there, and the red hair deviated onto this side. Emma Jean, this woman who has been a mystery for ages now, is none other than the matriarch of Pixar. Now, genetically it makes sense, but we need to circumvent another obstacle, surnames. Emma Jean has four daughters in this theoretical model I'm brainstorming upon right now, and all of them have since taken the last names of their husbands, all except Renata, who we know carries the surname Linguini. This is inconsistent with Emma, whose last name is presumably Jean after marrying Gary. If the postcard of Emma Jean was sent to Carl and Ellie prior to her remarriage, then her maiden name could be Jean, and Jerry's last name Linguini finally, once and for all, solving where Renata got her surname from. 
Renata is not commonly a French name, but it is quite European, so where on earth did the red girls grow up? And thus, we move on to locations. The Tri-County area currently contains the Davis Branch, San Francisco contains the Anderson Branch, Carl lives in his hijacked Zeppelin, what's left of the Gusteau Branch is in France, and the Shermans are spread from Australia to, yes, California just like the Davises and Andersons. Emma and Jerry are wishing you were here, meaning they're vacationing, presumably, but this is all during the years 2000 to 2015. Their movements are dynamic as ever. Initially though, these four core people likely all originated from the central US. Carl and Ellie stayed while Emma eventually spread her wings and sought out Gary. Carl's kids grew up in the Midwest-ish, and for reasons likely pertaining to Andy's father, Jennifer moved to California. Jillian and her family stayed in the Midwest, but eventually, yes, also ended up in California, San Francisco. Emma and Jerry seemed to be quite widespread, quite widespread indeed. Their two daughters were probably born in America, but clearly they all just travel lots. Adventure is out there, apparently, and Emma Jean seems to agree with the Fredricksons' sentiments, constantly wishing her extended family were there with her on her trips with Gary Linguini. Renata travels all over the map and lands herself in France for a time, while the other one lands herself in Australia and weds herself to a famous family in many sectors. So yes, the locations now too are sensible. Finally, we have to involve the biggest blockade, timing. Oh dear, do I need to overlay all of my timelines or should I just start fresh? So the top tier here is the early silent generation. Gary Linguini, Emma Jean, Elizabeth and Carl Fredrickson, amongst others of less linkable importance like the Sherman Doctors, Mabel Gusto, etc. The baby boomers and Gen X pretty much encapsulate the parents of this family tree. The Shermans and Gustos are on the earlier side, while the Davises and Andersons are on the latter half like the Red Twins. I mean, Emma could always be really old, but it's most likely that she had Carl's kids first. The kids, on the other hand, are all Millennials and Gen Z. Linguini is quite on the old side, though. So we've done it. We've finally done it. We've solved all of the logical blockades and even this out to actually make sense. All but one massive problem. We can't get into the further proof until we fix the glaring error. That is, Riley having modern technology, because if Finding Nemo takes place in 1995 to 2003 like I've theorized, and teenage Riley is seen in Finding Dory, then how on earth can Riley have such advanced computer technology and her dad have a modern cell phone? The picture of Elder Ellie can be seen in Riley's house as she's a toddler, meaning the years still match, so what we need to do is compare the years they all take place and the kids' ages, specific specs. A sample from each branch. Andy was born in 1987, Riley was born in 2003, Darla was born in 1995, Linguini was born around 1980-ish. We see Riley in the Marine Life Institute during Finding Dory, which takes place in 2004. Riley is not one year old, so clearly she wasn't born in 2003. This is not a me inconsistency, this is a Pixar inconsistency. You know, unless this world just has technology moving faster than your average world. I mean, just look at BNL, the technologically advanced super corporation of AI. Pixar's backed themselves into a corner with this one, but explained it via advancing technology and left no real date in the movie. Basically, these all take place in the 2000s, a time when laptops that look like this were still commonplace. It's more of a time range, but B&L and laptop designs are consistent. The other three films are consistent as well, such as how Jill reads about Colette in a magazine after she and Linguini open their new restaurant. But if that's the case, then Ratatouille has to take place in the earlier 2000s as well. But beyond that, now minor point of intrigue, things are sensible. But any additional patterns? Proof? Well, let's look at the wedding first. Come to think of it, I don't think Gary would have been here even as a young man, but Emma just has so many options. She has red hair, but it could have been slightly darkened like Ellie's or, you know what? As uncanny and flabbergasting as it is, the only real person who fits Emma Jean's description by personality, by genetics, perfect to a T, is Ellie. The eye color, the hair color, especially as it darkens and only the children of this tree have very orange hair. 
the age similarities. There are many candidates at the wedding, but Ellie, of all people, is the one I'd accuse of looking and acting the most similar to our tentative description of Emma Jean. Which means... Oh, no. Carl? Carl? Carl. Carl knew Emma through Ellie. Why? Could they be related? Could they be... sisters? The maiden name of Elizabeth has henceforth been unknown, but Jean could work. Oh my. Let's observe the wedding again. I'm fairly certain we see Ellie's parents in the front row of her wedding, but Carl's side is a bit different. I'm not so sure his mother is alive at the time of his marriage, but few perfectly fit for Emma. Ellie's family, though. The genetics would be on point. It would make sense. Emma's not some random mystery matriarch, but a sisterly divorcee. Her marriage to Carl was quite young, like age 18 or 19 based on the timeline, and they had Jen and Jill quite young, which would explain why they simply weren't ready to take all of it on. They raised them alongside two other adults by splitting up and remarrying to old flames when Carl is actually ready. He remarries at 25 and they try for kids in their early 30s or so. Emma, on the other hand, hops right into having Renata and, I guess we can call the other woman, Missy, short for Mrs. Sherman. So Jen and Jill are born in the 50s and, given Andy's graduation, Toy Story 3 does not take place in 2010 during its release, but rather like 2003 to 2005. Shocker, that's also when Finding Nemo takes place, which means Toy Story 3, Finding Dory, and Inside Out all take place within a time bracket that does not coincide with their release date. Pixar seems to ignore technological years in the case of Inside Out and Toy Story, only further supporting a technically superior universe due to BNL. Wow. Renata and Missy were born in the late 50s or early 60s, and Renata had Linguini rather early too, mistakenly. So, at this wedding, could the four girls be seen? Yes, Jill and Jen Fredrickson could easily be anywhere in this crowd. God knows there are plenty of kids that fit their genetic description perfectionistically. But it would seem as though we're still not done. What on earth is it with Pixar and making me do multi-video theories? Why is there so much? These are not the kinds of questions any normal person would attempt to solve, nor are they even remotely easy. I am the god of navigating around plot holes. Holy cow, this is ludicrous. So in part one, we recapped and established everything I've done before proposing the evidence and ideas required to theorize. In part two, we've theorized. We've solved everything like crazy. But aside from the very clean tree, the timeline is disorganized. And there are three final questions. What better reason could Andy have kept this letter? What is Jerry's link to being a toy cleaner and his step-grandson having the Woody doll? And finally, finally, what happens next? Where are they now? Who's dead? What does this timeline look like? Please do stay tuned, I've never gone so five-prongedly deep before. Click the subscribe button below, like, and comment your theories. It will motivate me to finish this faster. There's just so much, and I couldn't do it all in a short time span, but in one week, I will be finishing everything. Once and for all, the final Emma Jean universe theory, because to my knowledge, no other Pixar film belongs here in this universe. Then, then we can finally move on to the other universes in Pixar. To finally, once and for all, answer the true question to the most believable solution to an interfilm connection. A multiverse theory. A multi-timeline true Pixar theory designed to interlock with any possible future Pixar films seamlessly. Logically optimal and incredibly difficult. Click the bell if you want to be notified of when we finally wrap up this, like, 12 theory long escapade, because until next week, I'm the theorizer. So here we are, the final theory tying together Up, Inside Out, Finding Nemo, Toy Story, and Ratatouille. This has been a long time coming, but I'm assuming you've seen the last couple videos. If not, I'll link the first and second thirds of this three-part mega theory for you to see now by simply clicking on the white rectangles in the top right corner. This was supposed to be one big, like, 50-minute theory, but I, I had to split it up into three videos across a couple weeks. They're not long, but it's taken so long to figure this out, and this is the end of it all. Wrapping it all up by answering three final questions and posing a timeline with accurate dates based off of this family tree.
Hello. I've done it. Oh, have I ever done it. Easy? No. Not by a long shot. Fun? Sure. Logical analysis and theoretical deduction is like the icing on the cake that is my channel. It's a five-dimensional timeline, a pentagonal star of connections, each franchise connecting to the other with little timelines and interlocking data points. This video must be well organized. So first, here are two brief main questions that I think I can discuss possible answers to. Is there a significance in Grandpa Jerry being the toy cleaner who fixed up Woody? And why does Andy have his grandmother's postcard on his wall? Well, I think Jerry being a toy cleaner is no mistake, especially since he was brought in specifically to clean the very rare Woody doll. Perhaps the Woody doll means so much to Andy, because Gary was the one in the toy business, and already did have prior connections to this very specific doll, perhaps helping with the TV show. He knew just how to clean it, and he's a very professional, very genetically specific character. I do think this is a reference and a tie to the notion that the grand parental remarriages resulted in Andy getting the doll as a gift of some sort. As for the secondary question, I tried answering it back in my very first theory on Emma, in which I deduced that Andy, having the postcard, represented how he loves all of his grandparents, Emma, Carl, and the steps, Ellie and Derry. He loves how they all interconnect and love one another, how it could show a positive future for his allegedly divorced parents. Yes, divorced, because in 2018 I made a video where I solved his dad deeper. If you remember, YouTubers the Super Carlin Brothers interviewed a friend of one of Toy Story's creators who passed away, and the friend claimed that the creator had implemented a whole story about Andy's dad being in framed photos and dying and all this stuff, which Andrew Stanton, another creator, then sarcastically debunked on Twitter. I spent over 10 minutes analyzing his single tweet and came to the insane conclusion that this entire story was simply a headcanon of the deceased writer and thus its canonicity was too fickle to theorize on, effectively nullifying it from future theories. With all this in mind, the postcard, which is seen in some bonus content, I'm not even sure it's in Toy Story 3, is probably something personal to Andy, something in the vein of how his entire life is based around toys from one grandparent, exploration from another, love from yet another, and the mass of interconnections sewn throughout. So Andy's intrigued by the theories too, might as well finally do this timeline. But I warn you, the complexity is striking. It's horrific. I am literally merging my Finding Nemo timeline with my Ratatouille timeline and trying to deposit integral events in there to prove everything in the most official way possible alongside all of the other three timelines I tried to make with Up, Inside Out, and Toy Story. So here it is. I have all of the gaps between events right here from part two, and I know very well how long each gap is. They are consistent. It's the dates that squirm. In part two, I just threw up random numbers and reveals, but now I've had the time to connect more perfectly. Previously, I've just given year ranges, but in the name of specificity, I'm trying harder here. The most painstakingly accurate date you'll remember is Finding Nemo's 2003 time period. To connect these three timelines, we need to know how this fits in with the rest. Up and Inside Out's years are presumed unavailable unless they're super hidden or from an external source. Toy Story's years are irrelevant here, and Finding Nemo is our base, so I figured out the damn thing. You see, Inside Out shifts across this timeline and sort of drags Ratatouille and Finding Nemo with it wherever it goes, because the technology of BNL makes its dates extremely fickle. Based on the Aquascum 2003 Finding Nemo date, Finding Dory then is 2004, meaning Riley, who's about one year older here in Morro Bay, proves that Inside Out takes place in 2003 as well. In Riley's toddler flashback, the magazine with Colette is seen. This flashback is calculated then to take place in 1994, meaning Riley was born in 1991. If this magazine is one year after Linguini and Colette established their new restaurant, then it would mean Ratatouille is set in the early 90s. So I worked with this, and again, the technology is too fickle to use as evidence. Cell phones and computers are advanced in the Pixar multiverse due to the company known as BNL, such as how films like The Incredibles, which takes place in like the 50s or 60s, have insanely advanced tech too. 
Pixar backed themselves into a pit of plot holes and created an AI company to answer the futurism. But before I do one final summary of the enormous timeline, there is one irrefutable problem. I had just used Finding Nemo State to prove all of the movie's years, I flew with the assumption that Jen and Jill both had their kids around the same time, and ergo proved up inside out in Toy Story's years, all good. I spent hours on it, but then clarified on Twitter with fans, asking for them to debunk this idea of a 1994 Ratatouille setting. Adara the Shallot told me to check for dates, Seamus Gorman mentioned the technology thing, and many others told me to scan the film in general. I had planned to observe Renata's letter to Skinner more closely, and finally did it, much to my regret, because next to the letter, in Gusteau's will, it confirmed my greatest fear. I think the will says it was written in 2001. So, sh but it doesn't disconfirm everything, all it means is that Colette being on this magazine is not due to her and Linguini setting up shop. It's probably something else for being a famous female chef or a competition one or gusto related stuff, but it is something. It just happened when she was much younger prior to the film's occurrence date of the mid-2000s. But then, while writing this, I had an ultimatum aha moment like Remy from the film. I was watching Remy read the letters and I saw that Gusteau's will offers up his restaurant to any living relative within two years of his death. Meaning if this does say 2001, then Ratatouille as well takes place in 2003? What the hell? This is getting horrifyingly weird. Pixar now has three films that are set in 2003. What kind of mystery have I stumbled upon? What are they doing, willingly, pointing to 2003 in no convoluted way? I'm not sure, but this long video needs to be compressed, so reshifting the timeline, we're back in business, baby. Here we go, a final run through, five films, three timelines intersecting, color coded for my video series, most logical, definitely explainable in every direction, debunk it, I'll just make good bonus videos come navigating the debunction. Let's go. So it starts in the year 1895 with the establishment of a dentist's office in Sydney, Australia. A man named Mr. Sherman runs it and eventually passes it down to his son, Sherman Jr. In the years that follow, Sherman Jr. passes the business down to his son, Sherman III. Meanwhile, in America, four children are born, all within the central US. We have the adventurous quartet of Carl Fredrickson, Emma Jean, Elizabeth Jean, and Jerry Linguini. This is assuming the likelihood that Ellie and Emma could be sisters, what with the similar everything, including names. Imagine if Carl and Jerry are brothers too, but, um, no. Ha! <laughs> All born around 1930, they grow up seeking adventure and meet each other throughout the years while Carl and Ellie bond significantly as best friends. As all of this goes on, 1943 rolls around, and over in France, we have a large, jolly man known as Mr. Gusteau, who marries a woman named Mabel. They have two boys together, known as Anton Gusteau and Augusta Gusteau. Mabel loves cooking, and her husband loves eating. Back in Australia, it's now 1947, and Sherman III's son is getting ready to accept the business as his own. He and his wife now have two boys, Philip and an unnamed man who has an interest in music. As they age in Australia and the Gusto boys age in France, both sets of children are raised in extremely cultured homes, with the French studying the arts of criticism and culinary skill, and the Australians reveling in nature and marine life, as well as music and their inheritance of dentistry. The cultured brothers across the world age, while Carl Fredrickson starts to get a crush on one of his pals, but not his best friend, rather, her sister. They end up getting married at a very young age, at age 20 or younger. They have two daughters, Jillian and Jennifer. The year is 1950, and these young parents aren't ready. They need instant assistance with these children. They don't get so much as five years in as quality parents before they need to fix this system, so they consult Elizabeth Fredrickson and Jerry Linguini. Who better to raise these children than Carl's best friend and Emma's? So this group of friends devises a plan where Carl and Emma divorce, but they remarry to tie the whole group together legally so these adventurous parents can sustain such a life. Emma and Jerry get remarried promptly, and perhaps on their honeymoon or some other trip immediately surrounding the wedding. Emma, still a jean, sends them a postcard wishing Carl and Ellie could come, but they cannot. 
They have a wedding to prepare for. Very unprepared people here. Carl's side of the wedding is quiet and depressed, hints that his mother may have recently passed away, while Ellie's side is cheering and screaming with the possibility of Emma and Jerry being there if not vacationing still. On these vacations, the couple instantly decides to have kids and they end up giving birth to two more daughters around 1955 when all this goes down. Both are born with Ellie and Emma's signature red hair and green eyes. They name one Renata Linguini and the other, well, we don't know. Unnamed Linguini. This is the single most mysterious and detached part of the whole tree. I nicknamed her Missy, short for, well, the fact that we know she's a future Mrs. And it makes more sense than to call her by another name she won't have until the confusing adulthood. So it's still 1955, but Carl and Ellie cannot conceive kids, so they continue to raise the four daughters they now have with their two best friends, while Emma and Jerry travel and explore to their heart's content. Back in France, the two chef boys have grown up in an extremely culinary environment and Augusta shows brilliant signs of becoming one of the best cooks in France. Anton loves food like his fat father, but if he doesn't like it, he will not swallow it. This is most likely because he grows traumatized after his obese father dies suddenly around 1963, leaving the family instantly fractured and estranged. Anton completely delves into culinary criticism, which he is ruthlessly excellent at, and Augusta passionately takes over France's restaurant division like his mom had always wanted. This leaves Anton jealous from his lack of cooking ability, and he adopts the stage name Anton Ego to represent the way he sees everyone he once loved. He he travels to England for his work and leaves behind the world he now despises so much, which breaks his mother's heart, sending Mabel into a spiraling madness that only grows in the years that follow. As this all happens, the Australian brothers are having a much better time with their arts. Let's call the unnamed brother Mitty, as we know he's a mister, and it'll fit with his spouse in the end, we'll see. So Mitty has a hobby for music and pianism, while the older brother, Philip, is granted a job he willingly loves, the family's old dentistry business. He goes to school to become a dentist, loves it, but still wishes for a life of marine biology and naturalism, which Mitty has found a job in. In fact, in 1972, he travels to California's Marine Life Institute to study the growing trend of fish intelligence. Now it's time for the most ambitious crossover in history. Things are getting good, it's 1978, and Renata travels to France with her parents, where she immediately falls for the up-and-comer, Auguste Gusteau. He now has a small team in a restaurant he's opening, and Renata stays with him while Emma and Jerry travel back home to America. Anton Ego has become a prominent food critic in England, and Renata likely despises him for his actions toward the family she is now integrated with. The reason Missy wasn't here on this vacation is because she stayed back at the Linguini's new home in California, where she met the new Australian guy, Mitty. They fall in love in quite the same way Renata and Gusto do. These lustful redheads have the passion of their parents, and they dive headfirst into relationships with the worldly brothers. In 1983, Renata has a French son, Alfredo Linguini, but refuses to reveal that Gusto is his father. She doesn't tell anyone. She doesn't even tell Gusto himself. She refuses to disrupt his very important culinary work or introduce Linguini into that lifestyle at this time. Gusto's very stressed, you see. Linguini has Gary's nose and all of Emma Jean's genes, so it's not a stretch to say he isn't Gusto's, and she returns to America, granting him with his American accent. He is raised by the family of adventure, which Carl and Ellie are more than happy to aid with, as their frequent accidents prevent them from vacationing, so there's not much fun to have anywhere else. Oh boy, we're done the first half of the timeline, now let's get into the stuff actually seen in the movies. As all of this has been going down throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the original two daughters of Emma and Carl have grown into women who are quite independent from the rest of their family for the most part. Jillian Fredrickson stays in the central US, but Jennifer finds a man in California and moves there to birth Andy Davis in 1987. A boy as wondrous and creative as his many, many grandparents, one of which gives Andy a doll from his world toys. Jillian meets a man named William Anderson, and they have a daughter named Riley in 1991. Bill over here likely works for BNL, a massive futuristic conglomeration of sub-companies that has been accelerating the world's technology for years now. The family sends out recurrent photographs to all members, such as Ellie's now elder appearance being in young Riley's home. 
By the time 1995 rolls around, Andy has his birthday, and we finally see a film happen, that film being Toy Story 1. Missy and Mitty move back to Australia, and the problem child Darla Sherman is born, amplified by the near-instant divorce those two go through for reasons pertaining to... general nastiness. Mitty moves back to California, but Philip keeps an eye on Darla for his brother, who meets with her once a year because Missy stays in Australia with Darla, essentially swapping life locations with her husband. Things are looking up, but then... 2001 rolls around and sh** hits the fan when Renata gets sick. She returns to France with a now adult Alfredo Linguini and devises a plan to give her son a future. You see, Anton Ego has returned from England and has been successfully slamming dish after dish and book after book, all created by the brother he despises, which has ultimately subtracted one of Gusto's cherished stars. Gusteau slips into a depression because of his brother, and Renata prepares a letter should something go wrong. Unfortunately, something definitely does go wrong, and she dies of illness right on the night Ego personally returns to Gusto's restaurant to ruin his brother's career once and for all. Gusto is crushed by his brother, and then the news of Renata hits him like a freight train, and, presumably like his obese father, Gusto dies of hyper-stress induced by heartbreak from the two people he loved most in the world. Mabel Gusto immediately loses it and descends into madness as she watches reruns upon reruns of her son, buying all of his books, trying desperately to retain the memory of him. Anton Ego has descended even deeper into his tragedy, now seemingly irreparably damaged from the depression he caused. Damn, that sucks. Motherly estrangement is seen as the movie Ratatouille begins. In the year 2003, three movies occur simultaneously, Finding Nemo, Inside Out, and Ratatouille. The accumulations of these massive problems explode, but Linguini learns of Gusto and saves his uncle Ego from the void of depression while Riley and her parents move to California for Bill's job. There, Jennifer has probably divorced her husband, but she has a new baby with similar genetics to Riley named Molly. The Sherman family's accumulation hits its peak in 2003. This is when Darla is completely traumatized on her 8th birthday when her uncle's fish launch an attack on her. Philip, now completely convinced of this rise in marine intelligence, moves his practice to California to be with his brother where he shears sheep and owns animal life, as seen by his arm in the short film Boundin. Missy and Darla are left in Australia, but with nothing left for them there, they likely moved back to America, returning to Emma and Jerry. Toy Story 3 then occurs alongside Finding Dory in the year 2004, but during the next five years, Ellie Fredrickson gets quite ill and passes away, leaving Carl completely dead inside. Andy frames his grandma in memories on his wall, with things like postcards and the joys of his wonderfully complex family. Up occurs in 2009, and Carl has a nice new son figure by the end of it, having gone on more adventures than Emma ever could have in a lifetime. But finally, the question becomes, what happens next? Well, it's implied that Emma, too, has now died, leaving Gary as a denying old man, desperate for love, playing chess with a snarky jean girl no longer around. A tragedy of a short film, a truly desperate depression. This takes a toll on Carl, too, but he's lived his life and is ready to move on anyways, so he lives what's left with his new blimp and his amazing adventures. The other films have a somewhat happy ending, too, and me? Well, I move on, too to the next universe. We've solved the majority of this one. Let's now move through the multiverse interchange known as Monsters, Inc. and find a new universe to dive into. Perhaps one where AI has dominated like Wally or Cars, or maybe wherever The Incredibles is, I don't know. But this is far, far from over because Pixar is constantly updating their canon. I'll make a playlist filled with every single part of this massive three-year Pixar connection theory if you want to see it again. I'll link it above now. Stay the hell tuned! Subscribe for sure, and next, I might look at more details in these same films. We've finished off the human connections of this universe, but the animals. Remy. Remember, I'm not done with him and Gusto's ghost. There is more. Monsters, Inc. is a future timeline convergence that can hit back into the past like a multiversal interchange, and I will utilize this. Ring the bell, take my notifications, until next time, which will be very, very soon. I'm most definitely the Theorizer.
Hello, I am the Theorizer. I spent three and a half solid years making videos on something very complicated. A while ago, lots of people were discussing this cool idea that all of Pixar's movies are connected into one world along a gigantic timeline. It's very epic, but I chose to do something based purely off of minor details we see in the films, and I got a more multiversal answer. As I always do, I decided to fix all of Pixar's plot holes by filling in the gaps with information found in their other films. They've confirmed that they don't actually put this much thought into their character backstory, so I've spent three years proving, with a high degree of logical probability, the perfectly filled backstories using exclusively other information they have revealed. It was perfect because it was essentially a fanfiction theory that was entirely true because I simply filled holes with their own data. Now, this only applies to Toy Story, Inside Out, Finding Nemo, Ratatouille, and Up. I have a 12-part video series, all a part of one cohesive playlist, which I will link above in the card now. This is the final video. I promised I'd make a short epilogue if more evidence arose in Toy Story 4, or if people commented something of importance. Any more logical inconsistencies that need filling will be filled. I'm making this last video, and then I'll make one enormous two-hour long compilation video later this year for easier viewing. A feature-length film playing all of the theories back to back. So let's end this. This is the final video I will ever make regarding this five-film connection, this pentagonal universe, before I likely move on to their other films. The main reason I'm making this epilogue, because to my utter shock. Toy Story 4 revealed to us Emma Jean herself in the flesh as a guest star. No joke. Emma Jean. I solved her life story. Everything there is to know about her solved. But we never figured out what she looked like until I saw Pixar's latest addition to the Californian quintet, Toy Story 4. In this one, we finally see Emma Jean. Quickly recapping, Emma Jean is a mystery woman who sent a postcard. A postcard which is seen on Andy Davis's wall in deleted Toy Story 3 footage. The postcard was sent to Carl and Ellie Fredrickson from Up. I deduced in 2016 with loads of internal evidence and the director's own spontaneous statements that Emma Jean is Carl's ex-wife, with whom in that short period of time they birthed Andy's mom from Toy Story and Riley's mom from Inside Out. Emma moved on and married Gary from the short film Gary, Jerry's Game, whatever, and had Renata Linguini and Mrs. Sherman. Renata is, of course, Linguini's deceased mother from Ratatouille, and Mrs. Sherman is the mother of Darla from Finding Nemo. Hours of evidence once again, you can watch the videos. Genetics, locations, timing, all consistent. A massive family tree timeline conspiracy. All to prove that Emma Jean is the matriarch of Pixar. The center of the tree. Last I theorized, I claimed she's likely a redhead, green-eyed traveler, a weathered old woman with lots of worldly experience, who hangs most likely around California with her husband Gary. Unless she's dead, which would explain Gary's apparent loneliness in the short film. Well, I'm here to say, she's not dead. At least not in this time. Because Emma Jean is the antique shop owner from Toy Story 4. I thought it the second I saw her, and I'm sure lots of you did too, after watching my video on her genetics and then seeing her orange-haired granddaughter, because this woman is the only unexplored old woman of any significance in the entirety of these Pixar films. So yes, this woman is from California, one of our established key locations. That fits the bill. Her age is roughly around the age of which I claimed Andy's grandmother is supposed to be. Check. Her granddaughter's unique genetics match up perfectly with Mrs. Sherman and Renata Linguini. Bingo. But wait, who is her granddaughter? Clearly it is not Darla, and clearly it is not Linguini, so who is it? Did Emma have another child? Insofar as it is the only explanation, it would seem so. Again, all of this is just half-logic plot hole filling. But before we delve a little and finally factor in the last Toy Story movie, I need to address something commented on Part 12, something that does in fact save most issues from here on out. As you know, there are a few errors with the dates. Well, no, not really errors, just more or less, they aren't as fixed as I'd hoped. 
they're mostly just ranges, no truly definitive years. As much as I'd hoped for exacts, it simply isn't the case in terms of how to go about solving this. But the new evidence is so definitive that it trumps some of the ambiguity. It has something to do with locations. Remember how I said Emma Jean was traveling around the world, Australia and France primarily? Well, get a load of this. As commented by Eric Casper, a YouTube channel known as Let's Think searched and found that the zip code on Emma's postcard was sent from, get this, France. So for any of you who thought I was pulling European travels out of fucking nowhere, there you go. This is essentially logical confirmation. I went so far, explaining things, bending over backwards, and extending this glorified fanfiction into a family tree we never even begin to see in the films, traveling to various countries. This small but brilliant piece of evidence is what grabs both ends of this conspiracy and pulls it around, connecting the beginning to the end. A closed loop. We end where we began, with the postcard, proving that it all still makes sense, even at the furthest reaches I've ever made. Now on to Harmony and her grandmother, Blue Eyes. So if anything, this is somehow a third girl on Carl's side. There's little evidence more to suggest it. This is about all we've got. A prominent old Californian woman and proof of her red-haired, light-eyed genetics. Fortunately, the zip code on Emma Jean's postcard is just perfect. Emma Jean was traveling to France. It makes perfect sense. She owns an antiquarian gift shop. She lives relatively near Andy at a carnival fair place, not at all dissimilar to the likes of Carl's balloon-pumping occupation at the circus. She's a kindly, worldly, elder, perfect fit. It just makes sense. Even Gabby the doll looks like some sort of custom-made incarnation of a younger Emma. If any woman in any film is going to be Emma Jean, it is going to be this one. So that's that. Everything has been solved, to the best and briefest of my ability. If you have more evidence from the antique shop, be sure to comment. I will be pinning a list of additional evidence that you can find, particularly from Toy Story 4, because the bow on this series of mine needs to be tied. This is the last Pixar Theory video you'll see in terms of this specific family. Again, I'm going to, later this year, post one enormous compilation of the Californian Trilogy, the Ratatouille Trilogy, the Founding Nemo Trilogy, and this final Tetralogy, mixed into one enormous Tretacology, just like I did with the Coraline series. Stay tuned, make sure you definitely subscribe. There's a lot of theories still coming this year. You all seem to prefer it when I take a look at individual characters from Nickelodeon shows, so I'll be doing a little more of that, as well as some updates on popular TV show predictions I have. As far as films go, I've still got Flushed Away, Ice Age, Hoodwinked, and even more on my mind. So we'll see when I can deal with those too. Make sure to like and, again, comment your evidence towards this woman being Emma, because this is increasingly the ultimate conclusion. The only part that confuses me is the granddaughter, because we see her nowhere else. This 13-part magnum opus of Pixar's logical correction took everything I had out of me, and this is the end. Before this compilation ends, as it turns out, I made the same mistake at the very end that I made in the very first beginning video of all of this. The woman who owns the antique shop is confirmed in the credits to have a name other than Emma Jean. I will continue to work around this in the coming months and may or may not comment a fixed solution below because, holy crap, it's just, it has to be over.